Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston uh, for today's uh, status for uh, Discovery's preparations for launch on the STS-133 mission. Uh, joining our briefers today here in Houston, we have John Shannon, who's the Space Shuttle Program Manager, and Mike Supperdini, who is the International Space Station Program Manager. But we'll start our briefing uh, today with comments from the uh, Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Bill Gerstenmeier. He's actually located at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., so we'll start up there with comments, and then we'll come back here for comments and then take questions. So with that, I'll toss it to uh, Bill up in Washington. All right. Thank you, Kyle. <clears throat> Again, it's our, our pleasure to talk to you today. Um, like we've talked about before, is we want to kind of give you a continuous uh, status and continuous briefing of uh, what the work is going on with STS-133 as we're uh, progressing uh, towards uh, eventually getting that flight ready to go fly. Um, John and Michael talked to you some more in details about what's going on, and, and John had a very detailed meeting yesterday with the PRCB. He'll give you some details of that. Um, basically, the teams have made uh, very good progress uh, so far. They've done a lot of good analysis. They've done a lot of good of forensics, looking at the uh, at the uh, actual uh, stringers that were cracked on the tank and, and those activities. So they've done a very, very thorough job of uh, looking at the data at hand and, and ready to move forward. But I think we've kind of come to a point in the investigation where we need to do something a little bit different. It doesn't look like just pure analysis and the, the data at hand is going to reveal what really occurred on this on this tank uh, out on the launch pad and, and what will ultimately lead to flight rationale for us for the flight. So I think it's time that, that the teams have, have recommended we step back a little bit and do some testing. John will talk to you a little bit more in detail about the testing, but there's basically two things that we would like to go do from a test standpoint. Uh, we'd like to see if we can um, replicate what we think the most leading cause is of the failure. Uh, so there'll be a, a setup at Marshall or, or, or New Orleans where we'll actually uh, build up a stringer panel the way we would have for, ta for, a, uh, for a tank. Um, then we'll actually put some defects in, some uh, edge of manufacturing tolerances into that device and then actually load it up and see if we can replicate a, the crack that we saw during cryo loading during the, the tanking. So that will be one test that we'll get done. And then we'd also like to do a test down at the Cape where we actually uh, load the tank with cryogenic uh, propellant and then actually put some instrumentation on the tank, put some strain gauges, thermocouples, some other devices on the tank to actually monitor how the tank actually loads up. And that will serve to validate the math models and help us to better understand the environment that we see during loading and how that relates to the environment we see during launch. So we'll kind of approach it two ways. First of all, understand uh, what could have caused the crack uh, from a kind of a root cause standpoint. Instead of just looking at the data at hand, we'll actually do two tests to do that. One will look at the, the loading of the panel itself and the manufacturing defects. The other test will look at the loading conditions actually on the tank out at the pad. So we think between those two tests, we should get enough information that we can actually move forward and, and head in the right direction. So when we, we laid in those, those tests just kind of conceptually, there's really no way we can get there before the December launch window. So what we'd like to do now is just kind of take that off the table, let John and his team do a little bit of planning over the next several days, first part of next week, and uh, analyze the overall test plan and uh, the workflow between now as we go forward. Uh, so we're kind of setting the next launch date just tentatively around February 3rd. We'll again let John schedule and the work kind of flow out to see if that all can fit in. The first look is it looks like it fits before February 3rd, but before we pass judgment on that, we'll let John and his team actually analyze the work ahead and figure out the right thing to go do. So I, again, I think the teams have done a tremendous job of doing the work. It's time to pursue a different path, and that's to head out with uh, some test data. I have a quote uh, or kind of paraphrase from Hugh Dryden who used to do tests for NASA and it says, you know, the purpose of tests is to separate real from imagined problems and to reveal overlooked and unexpected problems. So basically what we're going to do with these tests is we're going to make sure we didn't overlook anything. We'll see if these tests can reveal any new information for us and it'll also help us sort out what the real problems are that we need to be working on versus ones that we just think theoretically may be there. So these tests stand to really move us forward. We're at that point in the, in the troubleshooting where we need to go add these additional tests. We'll take the time to do that and we'll get ready to go fly when it's time to go fly. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to uh, John and to Mike down in uh, Houston, and they'll give you some more details on the plans, and then we'll be ready to answer your questions. So, John? Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. Um, and and that, was a, that was a good overview of where we are. You know, we got into the, uh, into the uh, technical meeting yesterday, our Program Requirements Control Board, the PRCB, and the team is, uh, has been making very significant progress along the, the plan that we had laid out. And if you remember when I talked to you before and when this problem first occurred, um, we were uh, expecting to find an obvious problem, some kind of a, a flaw in the material, some kind of a, a crack that had been missed during the, uh, the construction of the, uh, of the inner tank area. Uh, and as we have gone through the investigation, uh, we're not finding that obvious flaw or that obvious problem. Uh, we're going through a very rigorous fault tree methodology where you lay out all the potential factors that could cause this and then through test or analysis work through them and, and either leave them on the fault tree as potential contributors or take them off if appropriate. Um, the team has done a lot of things in that fault tree investigation like we have, uh, we have done our fracture analysis where you actually look at the crack surface and uh, it showed uh, to a little bit of our surprise that there was no uh, initial crack in the, uh, in the stringer that was uh, exacerbated during the, the bending effects of uh, loading the cryo into the tank. Um, so that, that was a little bit of a surprise to us. Uh, we've also uh, finished our, uh, our initial look at the loads that the, uh, that stringer area would see uh, when we put uh, liquid oxygen into the tank, and uh, we think we understand that. We've compared that to the design, and the design looks very robust. Uh, it does not look like uh, it should be susceptible to having a crack uh, if it is assembled properly uh, when the uh, uh, initial uh, loading uh, occurs on the launch pad. Uh, we've looked at the material from that stringer, and the material is is right down the middle for hardness, uh, for tensile strength, for all the different uh, parameters that we would look at to see if it was if it had a problem. Uh, so, what has happened is we've we've hit a point where there is no obvious uh, answer as to what occurred. And uh, what that means is that we have to take the next step. And uh, we have to look uh, in, in greater detail uh, to understand what types of stresses you could put in these stringers during the assembly process, see how they could line up and add stress to that stringer. Uh, and we have to do that through a demonstration. Analysis is not going to get us there. Um, Bill, Bill quoted some test philosophy. You know, we got last week the the famous quote that, you know, one good test is equal to a thousand expert opinions, right? And so we're at the point where we need that test, we need that fine level of data and uh, to understand exactly how those assembly stresses could line up to give us a, a crack when we initially load it. And that's one side of it, is, is to understand how we could have pre-stressed the part. The other piece of it is we really need to understand what the loading environment does to that stringer. We need to understand to, the, to a, a very uh, fine level uh, exactly how much stress is put in that part at loading because if we're going to have an assembly uh, condition that adds stress to it, well, we need to know exactly what cryo-loading stress there is to determine if that is really a feasible root cause for what happened on the uh, STS-133 tank. Um, and it's like Bill said, analysis can only get you so far and it, it's time to go test. And that was the recommendation to Bill and the, and the senior leadership is that I need to, to better understand the conditions so that I can understand my root cause. From that root cause, I can determine if I have an adequate screening capability uh, to, to verify that I don't have this problem anywhere else. And uh, those two tests are going to, uh, to give me that data that I need. We'll assemble it, we'll, uh, we'll introduce flaws in the assembly that we think are, are uh, reasonable that could have happened uh, at, the, uh, at the plant. Uh, we'll understand through the instrumented tanking test uh, exactly <coughs> what level of stress we're putting on that stringer. We'll add those two together and see if we could have had the fracture of the part. Now the tanking test uh, we've been talking about for, uh, for a little over a week. Uh, we had considered just doing a tanking test with no 
instrumentation on it. Basically, you would load it up like you would for flight. Uh, we would go out afterwards and x-ray the uh, repaired area and, uh, and the other stringers and see if they did as expected during the, uh, during the tanking test. That's a little bit too, uh, too uh, gross of a test. It, it, it doesn't give us the fine level of detail that we need. Um, so we're in discussions today, tomorrow, Sunday, I believe like on Monday or Tuesday we'll have a really good plan for uh, where we want to put instrumentation. And the instrumentation is along three different paths. The first is strain gauges to directly measure the stress in the particular part. And we'll put strain gauges on the inside and outside of the repaired stringers of stringers that have not been repaired. And then some stringers that are just off to the side to, to make sure that there's nothing in this localized area that is, is having an issue. Um, so we'll have strain gauges, we'll have thermocouples because understanding the thermal environment and the boundary conditions on this structure is critical to understanding the stress level in it. Uh, so we will put thermocouples in there that will give us temperature uh, readings throughout the entire loading condition. Uh, and the last one is, uh, is an optical assessment. Uh, we're going to, uh, to uh, uh, have cameras, basically stereo vision cameras looking at the tank and we're gonna put uh, markings on the tank so that we can understand two things. One is the tank shrinkage that you get from the cryo. We, it shrinks about a half an inch radially, but we need to understand that uh, even better. And it also, as you load up the LOX tank and it fills up, you get a, a slight rotational component on the, uh, on the flange connecting to the inner tank. So we're hoping that the optical piece plus the, um, the uh, strain gauge measurement will give us a really great indication of what the stress level is in those stringers. And then that gives you the baseline stress. Uh, we believe the design is, is robust and, and should not fracture under that stress. We'll, we'll verify that uh, and then we'll add the assembly uh, uh, issues that you could potentially have to see if we can get to a root cause. Um, we were hopeful early on that, that, uh, that it would be some very obvious kind of flaw, didn't happen. Uh, then we were hopeful that uh, just a simple cryo tanking uh, would cover us for any ascent loads. It's very close, but it's not quite there. Um, so now, we, again, we have to go to that next level and really understand this problem to, to get the root cause and determine what our screening criteria is to, uh, to fly that tank confidently. So that's the next step we're, uh, we're marching down. Uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, that we're not making the December launch window. I think, as Michael tell you, we have, uh, we have good program plans to, uh, to overcome that. Uh, we want to make sure, though, that, uh, that we do this um, exactly right and, uh, and, uh, and step along the, the path. And as we learn more about the different conditions, then we'll, we'll make decisions as to, as to where we go from there. So that's, uh, that's our current status. And I think Mike was going to tell you about the, uh, the impacts that that whole plan will have on the ISS program. So good morning. Uh, before we get into a discussion about uh, with having 133 in the early February timeframe, I'll talk a little bit about near-term uh, activities on board ISS. Um, as you know, uh, our SpaceX uh, friends are out there uh, planning a uh, hot fire test uh, today. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. This particular flight is what we refer to as Demo 1. It's one of three demonstration flights that will occur over the next year before the first actual cargo flight flies to ISS uh, towards the end of, uh, of 2011. Uh, so that's very important to us as a program. Uh, in addition to that, on the 20th of uh, December, we're going to do a test with the special purpose dexterous manipulator on orbit. Uh, this test is um, in order to prepare ourselves for the removal of a couple of uh, ORUs that are flying up on HTV-2. We're actually going to move a couple of uh, what we refer to as CTCs or large boxes outside that hold m multiple smaller, uh, smaller ORUs, orbital replacement units. Um, so that's a very important test for us just to uh, exercise the system and make sure we're prepared uh, for the HTV flight that uh, will dock on January 27th. Of course, uh, the, the, uh, before that occurs, uh, we have the crew, the next crew coming to orbit. Uh, the 25 uh, Soyuz crew of uh, Katie Coleman, uh, Dmitry uh, Kondratev, and uh, Paolo uh, Nespoli. Uh, they actually landed in uh, Baikonur today, and they're, uh, they're doing their preparations for a, uh, a 15th of December launch. 
Uh, and then once they get to orbit, uh, the plan is to go ahead and do this, um, this uh, SPDM test that I talked about earlier. So all of those uh, plans are uh, in work. We've modified the crew time since we don't have 133 there. Uh, we've pulled up some of the work. Uh, we have uh, taken a couple of steps uh, in preparation for STS-133. One was to remove a, um, a cedra bed, uh, which we plan to return on, on uh, 133. So it's been removed. That work is behind us now. Um, so when we, so let's talk a little bit about 133 in the February timeframe. There's a number of things you look at with any flight when it moves around. One is, of course, uh, the items on board and, and how it may or may not affect your ability to do operations, either, either from a logistics standpoint or if, if you had planned operations that required an item that was coming up. Uh, the other is how does it fit in the vehicle traffic, which we work very hard these days to try to squeeze things in when there's holes as opposed to just uh, having one flight slip and then everybody slip to the right. That's a much more challenging uh, a uh, way to do business and we try not to operate that way. And then the last, of course, is the impact uh, to the timeline on orbit. This particular flight, although very uh, heavily loaded with supplies for ISS, uh, does not have that much in the way of day-to-day -day consumables. Uh, most of our food uh, for the near term is flying up on the HTV and the ATVs. Uh, that are flying up here early part of, uh, of next year. And the remainder consumables um, other than uh, those for the urine processing assembly are coming up on other vehicles as well. So we're in really good shape uh, consumable wise. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the tanks in the, U in the urine processor uh, that, we, uh, that collects the brine over time that we have to replace and bring home and empty uh, and bring back to orbit. We're down to our last tank on orbit. Uh, we're operating in a in a, a slower mode that primarily is uh, its purpose is to to utilize the UP on a semi-regular basis in order to keep the system working, um, as opposed to the level that we would do to process all the urine uh, that is uh, uh, produced by the crew members on board. Uh, this extends the life of the UPA and, and, uh, and of course the downside of that of course causes us not to produce as much water on orbit which is not a problem for us. We have quite a bit of water on board. But it also consumes yetevays which are the tanks that we put uh, urine in if, um, if we're not processing it. Uh, and so we're managing those consumables very closely. Um, STS-133 uh, had the advantage of bringing up five of these RFTAs, or their large uh, tanks, and so we, we would look forward to those coming up. However, both uh, the, the HTV that's coming up uh, in January and the ATV coming up in February both have uh, RFTAs as well. So from that respect, from a logistics standpoint, we're in good shape. Uh, from a vehicle traffic standpoint, the, the February 3rd date is actually chosen uh, because it fits inside the, the traffic pattern, uh, if you will. Uh, HTV uh, docks on the 27th of January, um, and then uh, the 41 Progress vehicle arrives on the 31st of January. We do have to do some maneuvers with the HTV. Uh, with this new plan, uh, because it, it berths to the Nader port, we can't have a vehicle on the Nader port of Node 2 when the, when the shuttle arrives. And so uh, we have a plan to maneuver it to the Zenith port to get it out of the way uh, when the shuttle, before the shuttle arrives. And that, that will be completed by uh, February 2nd. And then uh, that's what opens up the window for the shuttle to come dock on February 3rd. Um, we have a little work, a little analysis to do to, to uh, be able to do that maneuver, but it's, it's uh, well within our capability. Um, and, and, and that is, in fact, probably the biggest uh, change in our plan with the 133 flying in this timeline, in this time frame. Before the plan was to have, have 133 come up, um, and it was going to, uh, it, we were going to rearrange the stowage with the PMM on orbit. And in addition to that, it brings up a pallet. And this pallet has the locations where the ORUs that are coming up on the HTV were going to be put. So, so we have this relationship between now the HTV and the shuttle, and we need to make sure that the HTV is there uh, at least during the period of time when the shuttle's there so we can remove the ORUs out of the HTV, the large external ORUs out of the HTV, and install them in the pallet that the shuttle will bring up. Uh, so to order to ensure that we have uh, that capability, we're extending the on-orbit dock time of the HTV uh, for 60 days to ensure that we cover both the early and late February windows for our shuttle 
uh, shuttle flight, and uh, and that'll just protect our ability to uh, get the ORUs out of the HTV and installed uh, on their proper pallet uh, that the shuttle is bringing up on 133. Uh, so from a vehicle traffic standpoint, the, the big change for us is uh, HTV will dock at the Nader port and by the 2nd of February we will have moved it to the Zenith port. Before we move it to the Zenith port, we'll pull out the external pallet uh, and attach it to the gym exposed facility that's at the end of the gym module and then it'll just, that pallet will stay out there until the shuttle arrives and we move the, the, uh, the ELC from the payload bay of the shuttle to the ISS. Uh, then when ISS departs, we'll do the robotic maneuvers to put those two ORUs that are on the pallet that came from the HTV onto the pallets that the shuttle brought to ISS. And then we'll move uh, HTV back to the Nader port, reinstall that pallet, and then send it on its way. Uh, so that's, that's the biggest uh, change that flying in early February does to us. The rest of the flights, we've left them where they were and put the shuttle uh, in between, and so that's worked out uh, very well for us. Um, from a crew time standpoint, it's just our our day-to-day -day life is uh, is change, and uh, and and we've accommodated this. Like I said, we've gotten some of the tasks we plan to do actually during the shuttle flight 133 have already been accomplished by the crew uh, on orbit. And meanwhile, we're moving activities up that we would have un otherwise uh, had to postpone uh, because the shuttle was there. So we're we're jockeying around uh, the work of the crew on orbit. Uh, in order to accommodate this move, and that's relatively standard for us. Every day uh, brings a new uh, opportunity for us to, to replan the crew's day, and, and this is no different. So from a station standpoint, we're in good shape uh, with, the, with this move, and uh, we can support uh, whenever our shuttle, shuttle colleagues are ready to go fly. Okay, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, due to our unique configuration, if you would, when the microphone gets to you, address your question to the appropriate individual. And I've got a lot of people in about a half an hour to uh, support question and answer. So if you would, try to keep your question brief. Um, and we'll start right here with Mark. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mark Caro for Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, in your uh, comments today, I think it's for John Shannon or Bill Gerstenmeier, uh, in your comments today and those last week, um, it, it sounded like you you really are looking for an assembly, manufacturing, or transport uh, some sort of issue in the that's related to the movement or handling or assembly of the tank, rather than a design problem. And I'm just wondering if in the tests that you do, if there was some design issue, would that emerge as well as your testing intended to address that or would it just encompass that if that turned out to be the case? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. The, um, we understand the design uh, very well. What, uh, what we're trying to clarify is the loads that are imparted on that design during initial cryo-loading. So uh, our current belief is the design is robust and capable of handling those loads, but when we do the tanking test and really understand what those loads are, we may revise that opinion. So we'll see if we're a little bit closer to our, uh, to our uh, failure criteria. And, uh, and what you said previously about we're starting to home in on an assembly issue, uh, that's one of several different uh, possibilities coming out of the fault tree. We'll just rigorously work through that and, and, and we'll do testing where appropriate to, to understand that further. Robert. Um, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com uh, with a question for John Shannon. Um, can you just uh, uh, give us an overview of how this affects the manifest looking further down? What's the window for the f uh, February 3rd attempt? Do you still have that window at the end of the month as well? And then what does it do for STS-134 and if you got approved STS-135? Right. The, um Robert, the uh, the windows that, that we're looking at, as, as Suff had said, is um, uh, February 3rd through February 10th is the first one. And our current testing and analysis, uh, we believe, will support uh, that window. Of course, there are uh, decision points based on what we learn out of our testing to determine if we'll make that. But right now, that's, that's our next available window. The February 27th uh, window is still good. It's the 27th through March third, uh, sixth, I believe, yeah. And then we have uh, three windows in uh, April with a couple small beta violation cutouts. Uh, and then May, June, July, you all have launch opportunities in there. So, it, you know, what we, we have kind of mentally laid out so that we can prepare the, um, 
the teams that work on Endeavor and Atlantis is uh, is we expect to to be in a position to uh, to launch Discovery sometime in February. Uh, that will provide an opportunity to launch 134 in April. And uh, then we believe that, uh, that if we fly an STS-135 mission, that uh, June is still a real possibility for that, uh, or there are other options, you know, down later in the summer. So, uh, you know, right now we're really focused on discovery, but we still have to kind of lift our head up and make sure that we're, we're still protecting uh, the milestones to meet uh, further launch dates. So I'm thinking February, April, and then sometime in the summer is, uh, is reasonable. Mike, did you have any addition uh, to that? Yeah, I covered it. Eric, Eric Berger, with, <coughs> excuse me, with the Houston Chronicle, kind of following up on that question from Mike Suffredini. Um, given the fact that now a 134 may go up in April or even a bit later, does that diminish some of the need for 135, or would there still be a need from the station standpoint to fly that mission, uh, even though it sort of would become come closer to 134? Yeah, the need for uh, 135 is not based on uh, when the shuttle flies, it's based on the mass to orbit. And, uh, and so, so 133 and 134 are, are full, and, uh, and we have a, a um, manifest uh, that we've uh, planned for 135, which fills an MPLM, uh, so that we would lose that up mass, and that's the up mass we'd like to have in order to protect uh, any slips in the commercial cargo uh, flights coming up. Okay, let's go down to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for a couple of questions, please. Uh, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, um, probably for John Shannon. Could you envision um, not ever being able to find root cause, and if that were to be so, uh, could you, w would you fly 133 anyway at that point, or would that, or would you be recommending not to fly another shuttle flight? No, I have uh, I have strong confidence, Marcia, that this is a solvable problem. Uh, it is a little more subtle than we had initially believed it would be. Uh, I think through the testing plan that we have laid out that we're going to determine root cause, uh, then we'll have the discussion on what type of screens we have to protect for that root cause failure. So uh, that's the plan we have laid out, and, and I don't see us uh, deviating from that. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News, with one for John Shannon. Uh, actually, it's one, but maybe a couple of parts. On, the, on an instrumented fueling test, do you have a rough time frame for that? And I'm wondering, uh, at the pad, I'm assuming to install this sensor, as you're talking about cutting foam away, at least on the outside, to put it in, uh, you've got cabling issues and all of that. I'm just wondering if you could maybe just address the complexity of an instrumented fueling test at the pad. Thanks. Yes, yeah, good question. Uh, as for time frame, uh, we are uh, going to have the requirements defined by the middle of next week so that everybody agrees that yes this is the data that we need from the tank. Uh, my goal is to do this in uh, late December time frame. I, I would like to very much do it in December. Uh, it is very complicated because you roll the uh, rotating service structure away from the stack uh, when you fuel it and that's for things like Firex and, and, uh, and Viz and, and, and uh, just a lot of safety issues uh, associated with the, with the vehicle. Um, so what that means is that uh, you've got to find a way to get the cabling from the uh, inner tank region uh, to the fixed support structure. And there's several ways to do that. You can, you can hang cables down to the orbiter access arm. You can go up and uh, go across the, uh, the uh, OAA, the, orbiter, the, uh, the GOX vent line. Uh, you've got the GUP, which we all know quite well. And uh, so there's some ways to get it back to the fixed service structure. Um, the plan right now is that I want to do a test in a flight configuration. Uh, so what that means is that we would remove foam, that nice foam that they just put on the tank, right? We would go remove that, we would put our instrumentation on there, and then we're going to foam it back up uh, because I want the most accurate uh, models that I can possibly get of the, of the stress and the temperature in that area in a flight configuration. So that's going to, that takes time, and that's what is, uh, has kind of driven us out of the December window to get the fidelity of the test that we uh, desire. It's foam removal, it's instrumentation placement, it's you put the foam back on, it looks like a, a, the vehicle is uh, ready to go fly, except for the wires coming out of it, and, uh, and uh, we, uh, we collect all that data uh, uh, in as, as high a fidelity test as we possibly can. And um, uh, we're, we still have the discussion on 
uh, do you go to a complete different area of the uh, of the uh, locks inner tank flange uh, to capture more data, or do you stay in the area that uh, that we saw this problem in? Um, we're having discussions on the liquid hydrogen flange to see if uh, if that's something we want to instrument to gain more knowledge there as well. So it's uh, all that discussion will take place. Uh, over the weekend and early next week. We'll have the requirements set by the middle of next week and then we'll have the schedule laid out for the test and, and our goal is to do it in December. Okay, let's go to the phone bridge. I'll call on you in the order that you uh, called into the newsroom. First up, Andrew Cox. Are you there? Uh, I don't have a question right now, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Gina Sinceri, are you out there, Gina? about Peter Spots with Christian Science Monitor. Yeah, thanks a lot. This, uh, I may be misremembering, but I thought in a prior briefing there was uh, some discussion about uh, perhaps if, if the launch had to be delayed until February that that might affect the, the amount of uh, mass you can take up. If I'm remembering that correctly, um, I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit. And if I'm not remembering it correctly, let me know that too. <laughs> From a shuttle standpoint, there's a performance penalty for launching in February uh, that has to do with the uh, the temperature and the uh, the booster propellant and uh, how cool it gets. There's also uh, some uh, some atmospheric uh, effects of that. That it's about 300 or so pounds, and Mike has a plan. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we don't we don't have to go into the PMM. The the shuttle guys have worked with us very closely. Um, uh, the, the, um, we, there is a performance penalty. We make it up largely by removing ballast that uh, we don't require in the shuttle, actually. Um, and so we have, at one point, you do remember correctly, at one point we thought we might have to uh, uh, get the PMM out and uh, load some of the items in the mid-deck into the PMM um, to, to uh, be able to take it to orbit. But uh, the team has worked that very hard. Uh, together over the last uh, week or so, and uh, we've determined that it won't be necessary to get into the PMM. We've taken one or two very small items off um, out of the mid deck, and uh, those items are being shipped to uh, French Guiana. Will fly up as part of the late load on ATV. Um, but that's less than than 100 pounds worth of uh, worth of items, so it's a very small impact. Uh, but other than that, um, that was the only change we had to make in order to to meet the. Uh, these windows. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Uh, let's see, Denise Chow, space.com. Um, it sounds like the um, instrumentation tests and all that can be done with the shuttle at the pad. Um, this is a question for John Shannon. Do you anticipate at all having to roll back? Yeah, there's, uh, there's no uh, data right now that's driving us to, to roll back to the VAB. The only thing we've uh, thought about is it gives you access to the back side of the tank. So if we had a, uh, a condition where we felt it was important to x-ray the, uh, the stringers uh, on the back side of the tank away from the orbiter, uh, then we would, uh, we would do that to gain access. But uh, right now, that's not part of the plan. Okay, let's see. Uh, Carrie Sheridan, are you out there with AFP? I am, but I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Ken Kramer, Space Flight Magazine. You there, Ken? Hi, thank you. Yeah, actually, my question was also about the rollback. Um, if you did have to roll it back, however, what, what would be the consequence of that? And uh, are you have any consideration of possibly switching the flights 133 and 134? Thanks. Okay, I'll take the first part, and, and uh, Mike will take the second. Uh, if we had to do a rollback, if we were informed through our instrument tanking test or our stress analysis that um, that uh, we had an issue where we felt like we had to get x-rays on the back side of the tank, uh, we would do that. The preliminary look at a schedule would still support a February 3rd launch. Uh, and as far as 133 in front, in front of 134, because of the interaction with the HTV, we would like to fly uh, 133 uh, before uh, 134 flies. In addition to that, uh, 133 has a number of these uh, tank, uh, tanks that I referred to for the urine processing assembly. And uh, so we'd like to have a, a set of those on orbit so we uh, quit disposing of urine and, and instead process it uh, back into water. So. Uh, for those reasons, we'd like to keep 133 in, in front of 134. 
Okay, thanks, Ken. Let's see, uh, Gail Putrich, are you out there with Flight International? I am. Um, I guess the, most of the um, window questions have been answered. Um, I guess what I'm really wondering is how long can this keep pushing? I'm you were kind of breaking up, Gail. Can you repeat that? Sure. How, how long um, is NASA really able to keep pushing this back? I mean, you mentioned a date as far out as April or May. Um, is that like something you're seriously considering might happen? Well, what I would say, and Bill Gersmeyer may want to chime in on this one, is that you know our focus right now is on on STS-133 and discovery and and solving the technical issue uh, and launching in February. Um, looking downstream, it does not take us uh, significantly further past where we were prepared to launch a uh, 335 rescue mission. That was in in June anyway. Um, so the the end time for our last mission uh, really really hasn't changed. Um, but if we stumble on something that uh, that causes us to to rethink what we would need to do with the uh, with the external tank, then then we'll go back and look at the uh, the overall schedule. I don't know, Bill. Did you have any comments to that? Yeah, I guess you know, John. I I just kind of echo exactly what you said that we need to focus on 133 as we are. We'll take the time to understand the problem and we'll get ready to go fly when it fits. Um, we can address all the other what-if stuffs and see see where we are, but we've got uh, some margin in the remaining time frame. We can get the, the job done and things will fit from an overall flight standpoint. So I think right now the, the real job for us is to not worry too much about the overall schedule. We've got a good plan, as Mike laid out, from uh, being able to support station, and that's our ultimate goal is to leave station in the best configuration we can, and that's laid out well. We'll figure out a right way to get this understood, and then we'll take the data as it comes to us. We'll figure out what to do with it, and we'll move forward. But I think they've laid out a very sound plan that gives us plenty of margin, and, and we're not constrained overall from a mission standpoint and the way it falls and, and moves forward. So I think the thing for all of us to remember is we really want to make sure this flight is successful. We really need the cargo to space station. The best way to do that is do what the teams are exactly doing right now, is to do the testing that needs to be done to get the analysis done the proper way and get ready to go fly when it's time to go fly. OK, back uh, to the phone bridge or Bobby Block with the Orlando Sentinel. Bobby? Hey, I, I guess this is for, for Bill. Um, and then there's a quick follow-up that I have for, for, for John. But the, the first one is, if 134 was supposed to go in February, how does, that, how does moving this flight to February impact 134? And what budget impact is this going to have on, on, on uh, the program? And will that impact the uh, budget requirements for 135? Again, where we're thinking right now is we would move 133 to the February third window that opens up there, then 134 would fly around April 1st, and then that flight completes about the middle of April. So if you looked at where we were before, 134 was on the 28th of February or so. Now it's moved a couple days, uh, or I guess it's moved a, a little bit into the into the April time frame, and I think we have... We have sufficient uh, margin to, to go ahead and, uh, and go work all those activities from a budget standpoint. So we haven't really pushed or upset anything from an overall budget standpoint. Go ahead, Bobby. You said you had a follow-up. If, if, if previous tanks may have been seeing these similar problems and they just haven't missed? I mean, have we been flying with cracks before or is that still an, an unknown unknown? That's a, that's a good question. It's part of our, uh, our data mining. The, um, think about what we, what we have done. I'll give you two parts to this. The first is after we did the cryoloading, we saw the initial crack uh, and we uh, excavated the foam, uh, saw the, the other crack on the stringer right next to us that, that, uh, that may be related. Um, we did the x-ray of all the other uh, uh, stringers on the orbiter side of the, the vehicle that had just seen the cryo loading, and, uh, and it is very high fidelity x-rays. We were able to see down to, down to very small details, and there is nothing there. There are no cracks. Um, 
uh, we took the same uh, system over to the VAB and did the uh, the X-rays on uh, ET-138 and ET-122, and uh, they have not been cryo-loaded, but we couldn't find any flaws or any any fractures or, or anything at, at all in those areas, and that's all the way around the tank. Um, so, you know, the other piece of it that that you have to um, you have to understand the limitations of it is is the flight history piece of it. We have excellent uh, uh, views of the LOX inner tank flange pre-launch after we load it up and we're sitting there. And um, the either through the, uh, the television cameras or the final inspection team going out there, we would clearly have seen if we had a crack uh, up in that LOX flange area and, and we never have. Um, now, there's a more subtle question here. Could you have had a smaller crack that would not have displaced the foam that you were launching with uh, that you wouldn't have seen in that final inspection uh, team review? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. What I can say, though, is that our uh, assessment of all of the imagery that we have had, and we, we've spent the week going through it, the LOX inner tank flange has never lost a significant piece of foam. Um, you've had some erosion or maybe some popcorn in that area. We have never lost anything. And that's not a surprise because it's not susceptible to the uh, to the cryo pumping that you get down on the on the uh, uh, hydrogen tank flange area, um, where we have lost some foam and we've taken some significant actions to to mitigate that. Um, but up on the LO2 flange, we have, we've reviewed and we haven't lost any any significant pieces of foam. We've also looked very hard to see if we had any cracks, just to see if you had a crack that was, was in the foam that did not liberate the foam. Um, that's a lot harder to do. It depends on the lighting angle. It depends on the, the focus of the camera and stuff. Uh, so there are limitations to that, but we have not seen any cracks uh, from the, the imagery that we have so far. Um, so this was, this, is a, this was a unique event to us. And uh, I don't have any data that says that we've been flying with cracks all along. Um, there's some limitations to that because it's a secondary uh, look uh, through foam displacement as to whether you had a, a crack. Um, but I know on the tank that I have out at the pad right now on the orbiter side, uh, those 54 stringers, I, I have no other cracks. So that's, I'm sharing the data with you and, and you can draw you know, your own conclusions. There's limitations to that data but I also don't have anything that indicates that this is a, a generic kind of problem. Okay, let's see. Next up is Adam Mann. Are you there, Adam? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I guess this would be a, a question for, uh, for Mike or John. Um, is there any discussion? You said that both of the flights are, are full, uh, 133 and 134. Is there any discussion that the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which was meant to go up in February, would go up uh, on 133 instead? No, that would be a, a significant impact to, to rearrange the cargo bay at this point. Uh, so, so that's uh, not something we would entertain. Really, the objective is to fly these flights as, as we had planned. We have no reason to, to change the, the plan. The, the uh, AMS is processing well, and uh, they don't have a constraint to, uh, to waiting a little bit longer to go fly. And so, uh, so right now, the arrangement we have today works well for for uh, all the folks involved, and it would be a much, much bigger impact overall to the program to try to rearrange the payload bay, and you certainly couldn't do that in the next few months. It takes much longer than that. So uh, the fastest way to fly these flights is to fly them in the order that we've, uh, uh, that we've got them today. Okay, uh, two more folks before we close the briefing. Todd Halverson, Florida Today. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I have uh, one for Gerst and uh, maybe one for uh, John. It's kind of a two-parter. Um, I wonder if uh, you could give us an idea of the crew's reaction to the slip to February. And uh, for Gerst, um, there seems to have been a sense that uh, a slip into the new year might impact um, your ability to get the authorization you need to fly 135 and and I'm wondering if you think that this will have any impact on your ability to convince Congress to uh, go ahead with that one additional flight. Thanks. 
I'll take the uh, first part. Uh, we talked to Steve Lindsay, the uh, commander of STS-133, right after the PRCB yesterday. Of course, the astronaut office has been very uh, closely involved with this investigation. Uh, they were very supportive, understood exactly where we're headed, and Steve's only uh, comment to me is that uh, when the vehicle's ready, the crew will be ready. And your, your question about um, STS-135 uh, and the potential budget impacts of all these things moving, does it help or hurt our chances of getting 135? Uh, you know, I don't really think it changes it much one way or the other. Uh, again, you know, our commitment has been to really to stay focused on these flights and fly them safely and do what it takes to really make sure they're ready to go fly. And, you know, I, I said in a couple of flight readiness reviews back that uh, we would treat each one of these flights just like they were a regular flight in the sequence and we would work all issues with the same rigor that we would even though there's only a couple of flights left and and the teams have have done that we we're doing that exactly here so we are doing exactly the things that we talked about and laid out in terms of troubleshooting and, and working things forward and i look to our congressional friends and the folks here in washington to have that same respect for what we're doing that we're honoring our commitment to treat each one of these flights as a true true safety of flight issue to make sure we resolve these issues, move things forward, and, and I look to them to give us the same consideration from a budget standpoint, and I'm sure they will. So I don't see any concerns about this. We're focused on getting the vehicle ready to go fly, keep an International Space Station uh, resupplied so we can do really quality research there, and, and we'll move forward as we need to uh, going forward, and I don't see an impact one way or the other from a budget standpoint. Okay, thanks, Todd. Let's see, our last person on the line should be Irene Klotz with Reuters. Irene, are you there? Thanks, Kyle. Um, yes, and I also have a follow-on question for uh, Bill Gerstenmeier. Um, although uh, you're saying that you don't think this uh, delaying the launch till next year might impact the request for the 135 flight, but um, in the meantime, of course, things have changed and another continuing resolution looks like it's on the plate and uh, there's a budget overrun on James Webb and I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of the prioritization and um, where the 135 flight falls in the scheme of things and then as a as in a kind of a sidebar to that um, if you had any thoughts on whether a successful COTS-1 demo by SpaceX next week will um, alleviate some of the concerns and the need for that year's worth of supplies that you were planning on the 135 flight. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Irene. Uh, you know, I would first of all, again, say from a budget standpoint, I think the, the need for the flight is still as strong as it's been before. And, and what we've talked about for this flight is we really want to get those critical supplies to station so we can ensure that we get uh, good research done on station and we provide a little margin for the commercial uh, resupply uh, cargo flights that are that are coming online here with the flight next week so i don't think the hard re the requirement for this uh, sts 135 flight has changed at all technically um, you can see from our discussions about what order we fly the flights in what cargo is on the flights how mike describes the activities that he needs to do on station to keep the station resupplied and operational how really tight this entire sequence is and 135 is really critical to making sure we have robustness and margin to the schedule so then to kind of answer your second part of the question does a successful flight or a problem next week really change the need for 135? I'm not sure that it really changes that need much. What we're really looking for from 135 is some margin. You know, we, we want to, this is a unique opportunity for us to get supplies to station, and that can protect for a variety of problems that occur later in the development process for the uh, commercial cargo flights. You know, even though they have a successful flight next week, they still not have, they will not have demonstrated a rendezvous and docking to station, a rendezvous and berthing to station. That's a very tough activity, as we've seen from ATV and HTV. So there's tons of challenges that occur in a developmental program or even in space flight in general. So even though they have a very good flight next week, which we fully expect them to do, we need to be very mindful that they still have a lot of work in front of them on their plate and to have some additional margin provided by STS-135 to have some assurance that if they're a little bit late, they need a little more time to work a problem, they have the margin on station to go ahead and do that and it doesn't impact research on station. So, so my, my 
bottom line kind of is, I think STS 135 is extremely important to us. It adds critical margin where we can. We'll have to balance that against the budget needs that, that the overall nation faces and NASA faces. We'll have to make those trades amongst them. It won't be an easy trade, but the technical reason for 135 sits there. In my mind, it stays strong, and it's not diminished by what happens next week in terms of test flights, because there's still a lot of work that can happen. You know, we thought we were going to launch this shuttle flight. We had no idea we were going to get this uh, unique crack phenomena and slip the shuttle as much as we did. The same kind of uh, events can occur on the commercial side. They're not immune to any of the, the problems that, that, that we face all the time. In fact, they'll see the same problems as they do spaceflight. And to have the margin afforded by STS-135 could be absolutely critical to doing really good research on board space station. Okay, well, let's see. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, participating today. A couple of quick programming notes associated with that SpaceX launch next week that uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier mentioned. That there is a pre-launch news conference at 1:30 uh, in the afternoon Eastern Time Monday uh, for that launch, and the uh, launch coverage. Uh, for the SpaceX launch is uh, scheduled to begin about five minutes before the opening of a, about a three and a half hour long window that uh, starts at 9 a.m. or so uh, on Tuesday morning. So tune into NASA TV. We'll cover both of those events and there will be a post uh, post launch and post uh, recovery of the Dragon spacecraft news conference as well. So stay tuned for those events on Monday and Tuesday next week. Thanks everybody for coming and you guys have a great weekend. The tanking test is where the launch team loads about 535,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into Discovery's external fuel tank, just as it would be done for a real launch attempt. And the various parts of the tank are closely monitored and data is, is going to be recorded. Filling the tank is a procedure known as tanking and takes about three hours to fill the 154 foot tall external tank with the two super cold propellants. This is NASA Public Affairs at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We are at T minus five hours, 44 minutes, and 30 seconds into this tanking test countdown for Space Shuttle Discovery's SCS 133 mission to the International Space Station. We started this tanking process and this tanking test exactly on time at 7 a.m. Eastern, and we are in the process of the slow fill of liquid hydrogen into the external tank. That started at 7.12 a.m. Eastern. Joining us now here in the firing room number four at the Launch Control Center is uh, Mike Moses. He's the Space Shuttle Program Launch Integration Manager. And uh, you're going to talk us through why we're doing this test today. Sure thing, Alex. Good morning. Let's see. Uh, basically, the point of today's test is, uh, you know, we talked about this ever since we scrubbed. Um, we, we first looked at a potential tanking test for the for the GUP, which is the ground umbilical carrier plate, the basically the vent arm for the hydrogen tank uh, that takes the gaseous hydrogen off, that vents off the top of the tank and, and, and takes it out to the flare stack. Um, we, uh, as we went through that failure investigation, the team pretty much came up with the uh, root cause there. So, uh, and I know uh, you're going to have some folks in later to talk a little more details about exactly what they did. But, mm -hmm. but basically, as a result of, of all the rigor that they were able to put into their investigation, uh, we pretty much determined that uh, we did not need to do a tanking test just to check that the GUP was not going to leak again. So we initially said we weren't going to need a tanking test. Um, and then we started looking at it from the stringer crack issue. And, and really what kind of happened is, you know, uh, as we as we did that failure analysis, we looked at root cause and you're trying to find the obvious thing. And, and from a schedule perspective, the best chance that we had to launch back in the window we had in November, December was to uh, was that if this was an obvious problem that was easily fixable. Um, so we went off and looked, and, and you could tell right away from the imagery from the, that U-shaped foam crack that we knew a stringer underneath had probably cracked. 
Uh, we had never seen it before, but it was pretty obvious that that's probably what had done it. So when we scraped the foam off and we looked and we found that um, that became the, 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 the bigger problem for us in terms of being able to turn around and make launch. Yeah, and there's that's, that's the video of the, uh, the crack back on November 5th. And you can see that U kind of encompasses one of those stringer hats, we call them, the little U-shape uh, pieces that stick up. Um, so the big part we did was, was take that uh, failed part off. So you know, the KSC team focused on a repair while the analysis teams were off looking at, at all the other root causes. We had a fault tree team going. Uh, they call it a fishbone because when you lay out the main path, you take all these little branch paths off the possible contributors. It looks like, a, like the bones of a fish sitting on a plate, I guess. Um, it, you can't even read it. It's so densely packed <laughs> with, with lines right now. Um, and, and we had the teams looking at manufacturing and build up and uh, was there anything unique about uh, the loading event that day that maybe caused a problem. And, uh, and what we were kind of looking for, again, we weren't looking for it, but the, the path that would let us get out of the woods quickly would be uh, if we took that failed part off, took it back to the uh, Mashu assembly facility in Louisiana and found a defect that had escaped us. Uh, in, during manufacturing, a, a crack was introduced. It, it escaped our inspection processes and was delivered here to the pad with a crack or a flaw already in that stringer such that when we put the stress of loading on it, the, the cryogenics uh, in that oxygen tank, the crack appeared just as the level passed that flange point, that stringer. Um, the tops of those stringers correspond to a, a flange, a cord, that, that bolts up to the, the bottom half of the LOX tank, the liquid oxygen tank. And so as the liquid oxygen hit that point, the tank shrinks. It shrinks in radius about half an inch, so diameter is moving about an inch. Um, and so that stress caused the, the cord in the tank moved, but this stringer broke and didn't. So it, we say it popped out, but in reality it kind of stayed put and all the rest of the stringers uh, moved in. Um, and when it stayed put, that caused the foam to displace as well. So anyway, back to the, the root cause. If that had a problem, then that would be a, you, you cut the failed part out, you rep repair that failed part, and then you go off and look to make sure you don't have any other failed parts on the tank. So our, our initial thought was if we could find that initial flaw, this would be a an easily understood problem. And, and since we're still here doing a tanking test, that obviously didn't happen. So uh, the fractography, which is that, that investigation of the crack itself, showed no initial flaw. Um, it basically showed that the cracks on Stringer 7 and Stringer 6 were all uh, single event overload kind of stress cracks that basically instigated and, and ran um, in one shot. They, they didn't kind of start slowly and go. They just instantly cracked. Um, that doesn't mean you couldn't have had an internal defect to the part somewhere, but there was not a through crack uh, in the system anywhere. We also looked at the materials properties to make sure it was built right. It wasn't a, a bad batch of metal. It wasn't formed wrong. It wasn't heat treated wrong. None of that showed uh, any problems at all. So really, we kind of lost our, our smoking gun type of theory and had to go to the, the more insidious, what else could it have been? And, and the, the we've been slowly going along. About, well, uh, yesterday at the PRCB, the Program uh, Requirements Control Board, our big shuttle program main board, we sat and talked about status to date, and it all started to come clear yesterday. It, it, in reality, it's been this, this last week, it's all starting to come together. About two weeks ago, it kind of came together for us that, uh, that we were going to put this into two separate families. Either the stringer was the cause of the problem, that there was some assembly tolerance, some buildup of stress in that part, or a crack that we just didn't go through the system and we couldn't see. Uh, that caused this stringer to break, and so it's an isolated event, it's this stringer, and that's the problem. Or that uh, the other family is that the stringer was a victim here, and the design has a problem, the tank itself has a bigger issue to it, uh, the loading had a problem, um, and, that, and that there's something wrong generically that's causing stress to be concentrated in this area that's never been there before, and then this crack is kind of a, a symptom of a bigger problem. Now, all our analysis and modeling shows that that should not happen if uh, an, a properly assembled inner tank and a properly mated uh, uh, structure should be, should be fine, has plenty of margin, actually. It, and, and that's one of the things that gave us pause is those numbers showed to, to be we need a pretty big flaw to have caused this part to fail. Um, so we were thinking we'd see something obvious, uh, which is kind of why it headed us down that path. But anyway, so about two weeks ago, we kind of put those two in the family. And one of the best ways to kind of take that global is there something else wrong with this tank that we don't quite understand that the models don't show us uh, is to do a tanking test and do an instrumented tanking test. And so we, we kind of chose that option and, and kicked off. If you think about it, I think we put uh, close to 90, almost 100 pieces of instrumentation on the tank, uh, bonded them to, to both the plus and the minus Y, so both sides of the tank, ran the cables across the outside of the vehicle, put a whole bunch of dots on the outside of the tank to do some optics, 
um, all of that in a, in a very short period of time. It's an amazing amount of work by the the uh, the Marshall teams, the Michoud teams, on the ET project to design uh, what they needed, and then the Kennedy team to implement and put it on the tank and and route it and be ready to go here today. Even as early as uh, as probably Wednesday, I didn't think we'd be sitting here. Friday, I think I thought this would be Sunday mm. when we were finally ready to go. So the guys did an amazing job. But the point of the data, to go back to your original question, is why are we here today, is to gather performance data on the tank. So we have stringers instrumented in the repair area, uh, so we can look and see how that repair performs under a cryo load. We have stringers instrumented next to that repair that aren't damaged, uh, and so we can see how they perform. That'll give us some information about the general area around this local area to see if there's any non-linearities. And then on the opposite side of the tank, we've instrumented stringers to kind of go to a control type theory to say over here in a, in a completely different area, here's how the tank performs. And really what we want to look for is... Um, in addition to the details of the data, it's really that big picture of the data. Does the left side and the right side of the tank compare to each other? Are they performing in family? Do, do both sides perform the way the models show they would? Um, two points to this test. One is to gather data that we don't have to kind of ground our models. The other is we have pretty good models. Uh, do they perform properly? So, you know, we're looking for non-linearities. Is, is something obviously not tracking what we think it's going to? And then the performance of all these string gauges and thermocouples kind of, you know, are the temperature profiles what we think? Is there a spike in, in stress or strain that we do not expect to see? That would be an indication that there might be a, a different problem other than the stringer itself having a, a flaw or a defect that would put us in that second category or second family where the, the stringer was the victim here, not the cause. Um, none of our experts believe that to be the problem. None of our analysis or data uh, mining to date shows that that's going to be the case. This tanking test hopefully will give us the, the, the final set of data that lets us kind of declare that to be, uh, to be true. And now we can focus in on that first part. Um, so there's a very long-winded answer to your first question. <laughs> okay, well, I, but you, uh, even after all this, you don't expect to get that data right away today, unless there's something really obvious like a gushing gup or, you know, or, or, or foam that cracks you're not expecting results right away. I mean, you've got a lot more analysis to do, correct? Yeah, you're right. The, so the GUP is a pretty much a, a one or a zero. It's either going to leak or it doesn't. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good test. And, and uh, the team's very confident that that's not going to happen, but we'll get a good check on it today. Um, uh, if another stringer would crack such that the foam pops, um, we'd see that. There's nothing about loading today that's any different of a, of a stress environment than the loading we did on the, the launch attempt day. So we don't expect to see more things crack. I guess if the repair itself uh, didn't do its job, then we might see a problem there, but nobody expects that to be. So yeah, nothing's going to be obvious. Um, one of the other t catches is because the skin temperature, you know, these strain gauges are put right on the skin of the of the sh inner tank, which is half an inch, if less than that, away from the, the liquid oxygen tank at minus 400 degrees. Um, the, the data needs to be temperature compensated. So there's thermocouples there. So the raw data coming out of the strain gauges isn't going to be too meaningful until they have a chance to process that data. Uh, now all that's going to happen, I think we're generating, oh, I, I, I lost track when they went over five or six terabytes worth of data. <laughs> um, and, and all that's going to be post-processed and shipped to the, uh, the Mishu Assembly Facility and the Marshall Space Flight Center where the analysis will be done. That data will be there tonight. Um, the expectation is by the weekend we'll have reviewed all that. And, uh, and, and as you guys know, we decided we were going to roll back to the VAB. Uh, and so one of the go-no-goes for that rollback is uh, a report from that instrumentation team that they are happy with the data. That doesn't mean we've analyzed it and, and the, the results of the data are good, but that we, we captured good data. Uh, the quality of it is fine. The sample rates are good. We didn't, we didn't have a, a data gathering problem. Uh, and then, then we can, we're not going to remove the instrumentation, but we can cut the wiring and then deconfigure the vehicle and be ready to roll back. So that's going to happen on, on Sunday. And, and our big picture plan is probably then Monday, Tuesday, next week, we'll start to get the results of that data in. Um, it's going to take a while before we get all the fine details, but the big picture, are there nonlinearities? Is the left and the right good? All that's going to happen early next week, and we'll be talking about that as a program as we, as we hit next week. Okay, but if, if, we, if we can get back to the rollback in a second, I just wanted to ask you, there were kind of two main tests that you guys talked about on December 3rd that uh, when you really decided you, you needed more time, you needed more data before you can make another launch attempt. The tanking test was one of them. The other thing was mock-ups that you were going to be doing at the Michoud Assembly Facility in, uh, outside uh, New Orleans. How have those, how's that been progressing? Uh, actually, very well. That's been a, a, a big pause. Like I said, yesterday we talked, um, that, so two weeks ago we decided we needed to do the instrument tanking test. Uh, this week we talked, uh, and, and on that fishbone we're basically, we're able to eliminate a whole lot of things, and, and all that component level testing is really the main contributor to being able to, to remove things off that, that fishbone. So uh, at, at the Mashu Assembly Facility, they've been doing um, a lot of coupon testing on, on stringer pieces 
to find how you could induce a flaw. Uh, they've been doing uh, fastener checks. So did the the act of installing these these fasteners, these high lock fasteners, or the GP lock bolts that we put on the on the stringer to bolt it to the uh, the sheet metal. Did the uh, the act of installing one of those cause a, d a damaged site, a flaw, a ding that could propagate? Um, there, uh, that testing's all been going really well and, and showing that uh, it's very difficult to cause uh, a problem that would have caused this magnitude uh, of a failure that would have not been caught at MAF before they before they shipped the tank to us. At Marshall Space Flight Center, they're they're mocking up uh, single stringers and three stringer panels, uh, and they're going to basically go induce flaws. So so what we've kind of determined on the fishbone is the the real big area that's left as a contributor, the the most probable cause grouping is the assembly and manufacture and, and processing of the tank. Um, these stringers are put on, uh, basically there's a four foot wide by 21 foot long piece of sheet metal. Those two four foot panels uh, have stringers bolted to them, riveted to them. They're then joined in to make one big eight foot panel and then that becomes a panel of the inner tank and there's, uh, there's uh, eight total panels on that inner tank. The two right next to the SRBs are called thrust panels. Those are actually solid machined aluminum, so they're a different family altogether than the than the, the panels that are out in the, the acreage of the inner tank. And they take the most stress during launch, is that correct? Yeah, they're yeah. the main load path. In, in fact, it's one of the things you, you, you don't obviously see when you look at the external tank. Y you kind of probably think it's just the ox tank, it's the fuel tank, it's just the big fuel tank. It's the main structural backbone of the entire stack. Um, there's a thrust beam that runs through that inner tank that connects the left and the right SRB boosters together. Um, and then that thrust in, and load is carried through the thrust panel down into the hydrogen tank, uh, which is holding on the orbiter. So the orbiter is basically bolted to the top of the inner tank, um, or at the, uh, at the bottom of the inner tank, sorry, with the, uh, uh, the nose and then at the base of the orbiter down by the bottom of the uh, hydrogen tank. All this is held to the pad with, you know, four bolts per SRB holding the, the SRBs to the launch pad. Nothing else is affixed to the launch pad. So the SRBs are held down. Uh, the external tank's holding them up, and then the orbiter's hung off the side of the external tank. So it's a truly complicated piece of machinery, <laughs> even though it's just a big piece of metal with some fuel tanks on it. It's the main structural path for the, for the vehicle. So anyway, those, uh, those stringer tests were really defined that, that when, you, when you build it up, you could induce some, um, some stress. So you might not have cracked the part, uh, which it doesn't look like we did. All our, our paperwork and all our, our processes show that a crack would have been caught um, and like I said, the fractography of the failed piece showed that a crack was not there. Mm. So it looks like what we probably had happen was during assembly, we introduced stress such that uh, this part was kind of preloaded with some stress. And then the extra stress of cryo loading was enough to then break it and exceed its capacity. Um, when you bolt this down, you kind of clamp it together. That clamping, uh, there could be gaps uh, between the parts such that when you then riveted up with, a, I think, the, the, the lock bolts that we put in are something like a 5,000-pound uh, force load that you could trap a lot of that force into the part if there's a gap. We've learned that um, on this particular panel, um, the, the half panels right next to the thrust panels have doublers. So in addition to the, the big main sheet of sheet metal, there's a, a second piece. In fact, there's also a third piece on some of the stringers to give it extra reinforcement. And if you think about it, that's where the main thrust load's coming in. So those doublers are kind of there in a Y shape to distribute that thrust throughout the, uh, the LOX tank, not just concentrated on one particular panel. Um, one of those uh, shims goes into that panel early in the assembly process, it's kind of sandwiched together such that when you then go bolt the stringers on later, you can't see physically where that cord uh, and that, sh that shim uh, meet up. And if you have a gap back there, uh, you could induce some stress. We've done this, nothing's changed in the process. This is the way we've always done it. So there's probably been exceedances and gaps a little higher than we probably needed them to be all along. But it, it's one of the things that then stack up. And so when you when you stack up the that there might have been a gap there and you stack up that you might have clamped it down a little too hard, which made the feet splay out a little. Uh, and then when you look at the the stringer itself, this particular stringer based on the x-rays is about a, oh, it's a, it's it's, it's hard to see, but it's like a tenth of an inch a little further north on the tank, up the tank, than the other stringers, which means these things are preformed with a bend in them. That bend is now in a different place than it was supposed to be. So on these half panels, you have these groupings of things that if they line up on you, could cause a problem. That's what the big three, th three stringer and single stringer tests at, at Marshall are going to be for, is to go put those flaws, manufacturing defects, so to speak, into a panel, 
and then load it and see if that's big enough and, and can cause the stresses we need to, to recreate the failure we had. So kind of the proof of the, the pudding, so to speak, of, of our theory of what could happen really can happen, and that, that could be our most contributor, most probable contributor to the problem that we've had today. So all that, all that says is, you know, we're not probably going to come out of here with a, a smoking gun, but we're going to come out of here with a, a family of failures, and we're going to have a lot of testing to then make sure we, we're not fooling ourselves that we kind of picked the one that matches what we see, go really prove that it can match what you see. And we're talking with Mike Moses, uh, Space Shuttle Program Launch Integration Manager, and uh, we're in about uh, 32 minutes into the tanking test for Space Shuttle Discovery's SS-133 mission. The video we have right up there now, you'd uh, touched on there a second ago. Um, I think we did start out the tanking t uh, on time at 7 a.m., and the liquid hydrogen started the slow fill process at uh, 7, 12 a.m. A picture we were seeing there a minute ago was actually um, the dots you were talking to, some of the, uh, the which are used for the high, I guess it's, a high, it's, it's basically, it's, it's 3D, if you can go through it, if you could just talk about it for a second, it's, it's, it's 3D high resolution cameras, you put more than 10,000 little black dots on the yeah, section a, of the tank. I, yeah, a whole, a whole lot of dots. Um, hand, paint, hand put, by the way. Yep, fin finger painting. We, we, we did finger painting. <laughs> um, so the area you're looking at the camera right now, that's actually the uh, panel two, which is where the damage was. So that's actually where the cracked stringers were. Um, and you can kind of tell the new white-looking foam hasn't had a chance to age in the sun and get orange yet because we keep taking it back off and doing <laughs> doing other things to it. Right. Um, so we, we, we took that area back off, and we, we went in and added all the instrumentation. That's the big uh, copper-colored cables you see running in and out there. And then when we sprayed the new foam on, the dots are basically for this photogrammetry technique, which is really you have um, a, a set of cameras that are offset from each other. So there's a stereoscopic camera two cameras pointing at the same place with a known baseline distance between them focused on this area and what they'll do is they'll be able to then measure the movement of this this zone so each of these dots kind of allows them to track what one camera sees where the dot goes versus where the other camera sees the dot goes and you'll be able to tr create a 3d mapping of how this flange shrinks uh, and and potentially rotates. One of the other things we're worried about is the flange, we know it shrinks in, 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 but some of the modeling shows that it also, it won't shrink uniformly, so it might rotate a little bit. And if we add that rotational load into the stringer loading and not just a simple moving in and out in a single plane, then you don't need nearly as big of a flaw to cause the problem because that's a much higher coupled load now if there's a rotational component to it as well. So that's, that's data we're really looking to get. Um, and one of the ways to do it uh, would have been to, to strip foam off of a whole lot of the flange and add a whole bunch of strain gauges. Um, and the teams came up. Uh, it was actually the, the Glenn Research Center uh, had done this technique before for us in the shuttle program back with Return to Flight to help with some of the RCC, the wing leading edge imagery. Um, and so this technique was, was much easier, much less intrusive, even though it required painting a whole lot of dots on the side of the tank. So this you're seeing here on panel two on the kind of around the, the backside over by where the gup is we painted a, a much bigger area with I think it's something like 27,000 dots uh, over on panel six to gather uh, more data back on that side the, the, the reason we kind of split between the two is here on the front side of the tank we are worried about debris this is a very critical debris zone and um, that paint would then if, if foam wanted to pop off in, in what we call popcorning which is little tiny pieces of foam that have little tiny air pockets that just kind of as you go up through the atmosphere they, they literally pop off like a piece of popcorn no debris risk at all but if there's a glob of paint on top of that you'll now lump up some popcorn together and you could pull off a bigger piece of foam so before we fly we will strip that foam back off and remove those dots but on the back side of the tank we can leave those dots in place so we 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 dotted up a much bigger area back there to gather even more data in a, in a debris zone that's not a, a risk to us. So that's, a, that's the 3D imagery. So we talked about the strain gauges and the thermocouples. There's this 3D imagery. And then finally, the last piece of data is really after we finish tanking, we're going to go X-ray um, and take X-rays again of this flange to make sure no cracks have occurred that didn't cause the foam to crack. You know, you could have a smaller crack um, that might not be big enough to make the foam itself displace, but we want to make sure we don't have any of those. One of the things we're going to go back to the VAB for is to look at the back side of the tank. We call it the minus Z side. It's the part that doesn't have the orbiter on it. Um, we've never been able to look at that since this first crack appeared, so this will give us a chance to take a look at the, uh, at the back side. We've kind of always thought we might need to do that. Um, we were kind of waiting for some of the analysis to show structurally did we need to do that. It, this is kind of two problems, right? If the, 
if the stringer pops structurally, that's not supposed to happen. So did you structurally compromise your tank? And then next to the orbiter, if the foam cracks, now you've displaced it and you could lose a piece of foam. That's a very big deal from a debris standpoint. Um, our analysis is showing that if the foam does crack, that's a concern and we cannot, f we cannot live with that. Um, and so we know that we can't have a problem on the front side of the tank. On the back side, the analysis was coming in to show that we could probably fail two stringers, have two stringers next to each other that crack like this, and structurally will still be fine. Uh, but three in a row would be a problem. Um, but there's some fuzz in that model. There's some assumptions in that model. And then ultimately, you got to kind of play the card, too, of um, if we have more cracks than just this one, even though they didn't break the foam, th that might make us reevaluate some of this fishbone analysis, this root cause analysis to say, you know, do we truly understand that we could have had so many manufacturing defects all just on one tank? Um, and so we are going to go get that data, and uh, and we are going to ND the back side of the tank just to make sure there's no cracks back there. So um, both from the previous loading and this loading, we'll be able to look at all the stringers on the flange to make sure they've all performed properly. We'll be able to then detail inspect the uh, the repair that we did, make sure it performed properly, and kind of just put that uh, feather in our cap to say that that uh, that we don't have any other problems on this tank. So that's that's I think I'm answering your next question is heading back to the VAB. Uh, yeah. So you, so your plan is to to do the this this non destructive evaluation techniques this basically x raying of uh, underneath the foam the entire inner tank area which you haven't been able to do yeah 360 degrees around and you'll take the dots and you'll basically strip the foam off and get the instrumentation off that you put on in the past week take that off in the vehicle assembly building and then what possibly depending on what data you get you might are modifications possibly in in the in the cards or yeah that's that's certainly possible you know we need to take the instrumentation back off because um well a we don't want the wiring sticking out <laughs> um and and b the, the you know these things are bonded to the metal and then the foam's put on top of that that's not a certified configuration we could probably go off and certify it's okay to to leave these these instrumentation stickers on the tank but it's it's easier to actually just take them back off again um and then so we'll re-foam out that area and close it out one more time um, but uh, the results of this test, the results of all the three stringer testing at Marshall and at Mishu, the results of the single stringer coupon testing, all the fishbone analysis, um, all the NASTRAN modeling and, and computer modeling, all that is going to feed into our ability to, to determine whether we have acceptable rationale to fly, that this tank is good. Um, if at the end of the day we come out with a, an answer that says there's some things here we just we can't control. So there's two pieces, right? There's the can we find a root cause enough to know why this happened? And we're getting much smarter as we go every day. Uh, we are we are a hundred times smarter than we were a week ago, and and we're a thousand times smarter than we were when the failure first happened. So that's coming along really nicely. We're gonna we're gonna come up with some most probable causes. Um, the next piece is, can you screen those ahead of time? So you now know what might have caused it. Can you go show that you're not gonna have it happen again? Um, we initially thought, you know, again, in that an easy way to get to flight rationale would be. Um, the cryo loading. So there's, if you think about it, there's two kind of loads that go in this tank. There's the shrinking, which pulls the stringers in, and then there's ascent, uh, and the fact that these stringers are helping hold up uh, a, a tank full of liquid oxygen, millions of gallons of liquid oxygen sitting in, and then we're going to accelerate that up through the atmosphere. So axially, we're putting a lot of load down the tank. Um, and so um, does the loading of cryo put a stress in the part that's big enough such that if it had this manufacturing flaw, had these stack up of tolerances, that it would break at loading as opposed to breaking during ascent. Can we screen the say, if we fill it up with cryo, x-ray it to make sure it didn't break, we know it won't break after that. If that answer was true, we'd be in really good shape and we could then go fly. Um, it turns out that answer is not completely true. It is true for some of the fasteners on this stringer. Uh, the first couple um, see the the loading pulling that stringer in. Obviously, if you think about it, you get this 21 foot long piece of metal that's trying to bend in. The very end of it's going to see the highest stress. So those are getting the highest load from cryo tanking. But the next couple right below it are seeing a highest load from ascent, um, and that load, um, and then the, sh the 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 rivets down below that are actually in compression, and and cracks can't propagate in compression, so they they don't become a problem for us. So the answer is not a clean one. So we don't have a complete screen. So now you got to look at how are we going to build. Uh, risk acceptance rationale to fly. At the end of the day, we're going to have to, we're not going to be able to completely control the problem. Um, and so we are talking about potential modifications that would allow us to control pieces that we, we can't or we don't understand well enough or that are too big of a risk to us. Um, again, these high debris areas are a big risk for us. Uh, and then structurally, we're looking at this, this uh, the areas next to the thrust panel as one of the main load carrying paths. So that's an area we wanted to concentrate on as well. Um, so we are talking about potential mods. The teams are working in parallel on that. 
Uh, we have a few on the plate. We talked uh, we talked those yesterday at the uh, at the program level. Um, what we're looking at uh, potentially doing, if the if the the data shows that we need to, would be to basically go in and add what we're calling radius blocks, which are basically doublers uh, along the rivet line for um, about 36 stringers that are in this region where this the the shim shim I was talking about that's between the doubler that you can't see. That seems to be our highest risk area. <coughs> or I should say the highest probability that if we're going to have stack up of problems, that's where it's going to occur. So we can kind of take that part out of the equation if we if we reinforce that area. We have to make sure that reinforcement doesn't have unintended consequences by stiffening up a part, changing the design, um, changing the overall load path. And so there's still a lot of homework to do before we say go put that mod on the tank. But it, it has a lot of potential to then take a big piece of the risk off the table for us, leaving us with, with something left that, that would probably then be acceptable and, and have a path to get towards flight rationale. So we are going to talk about that. The results of this tanking test are going to do a lot to help us with that, uh, the stringer testing at Marshall. Um, you might see a schedule-wise, you know, we're going to have to probably, we've been talking a lot about doing the mod because we need to be ready to if the data shows us to. Uh, that would be occurring next year or so, uh, or in January. So we'll see how that goes. Next, it's next year. Yeah. Next year, yeah. It just <laughs> seems dramatic when you call it next year. But, uh, yeah, there's still a lot of work being done. Um, we're going to have folks working around the country uh, right through the Christmas holiday here to, to be ready to, to potentially fly again in this February launch window when it comes around. So this would, be if, again, if everything lines up, you get the data that, you, that you're that you hoping to get, if notifications are necessary, you would look to bring Discovery back to the launch pad somewhere mid-next month? Yeah, it would be, it'd be mid-January time frame. You know, the date moves around, um, it, but it's in the, the 13, 14, 15-ish time frame, you know, I, I, within a week of that milestone. Um, we'd head back out to the pad. Uh, that would be to be able to set us up for a February 3rd launch attempt. That window, I think, runs from... February 3rd to the 10th, I believe, is the length of that window, and then another one opens back up on the 27th. Um, there's nothing magic about having to make that first February window. Um, it's just so, you know, it's schedule awareness. So we need to head back to the pad mid-January to be able to be ready for the, the first window. If we can, we will do that. If we can't, we won't, and we'll stay until the, the next opportunity. So that's just kind of the milestones in front of us on what potentially is next for us, both in the VAB and then when we get back out to the pad. Okay. <coughs> Well, Mike, thank you for uh, taking a lot more time than I was uh, that, uh, that that I thought I was going to be able to squeeze out of you and uh, walking us through this because it really does help us to to get a better understanding with this entire. I mean, it's a tanking test, and that sounds very simple when you start talking tens of thousands of dots and <laughs> HD cameras and and, and 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 90 plus sensors on the tank. It, it's a fairly complex tanking test, much more elaborate than we did last year, like you said with the uh, the GUP tanking test in uh, July 1st, where it was just a Gup leaks or a gup doesn't leak? Yeah, that was just a fill it up and see if it leaks, and, and this one is definitely much more complicated. Um, it's going to generate a lot of data that we've we've not had when we were when we were first laying this out to the the external tank project. Um, you know, down here we're thinking, okay, we had a structural problem. They're going to want strain gauges all over the place to see how uh, structurally the materials responded, and they first came in with, um, yeah, that's all great, but we really want a bunch of thermocouples. And we okay, yeah, you need to temperature compensate. The actual thermal profile that this part sees as the cryo loads it up um, isn't measured because we don't do full up, full scale testing. So we don't have a lot of data to validate that part of the model. And, and a lot of the uncertainties in the model uh, are in the what thermal assumptions are you putting in there. So just having this that data alone is going to really help refine the answers. It's not going to change the answer, but it's going to give us a much more accurate answer. Um, and so there's things you learn like that as you go through this process to, to really kind of understand uh, other ways. And then this, this photogrammetry technique almost seems like black magic, but uh, it works really good in the lab. This is the first time we've done it on such a large-scale object that's actually sitting out in the environment. Um, not only is the tank going to be moving in the wind uh, and moving as it shrinks as it's loaded, but the cameras on the, on the, the service structure are going to be moving. Um, being able to back out the data, one of the reasons they want so many dots is it helps them take those uncertainties back out. It's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, none of this is mandatory data. It's all just building in the direction of goodness. So if for some reason we don't get great data out of that uh, photogrammetry uh, stuff, that's that's okay. If we have a couple thermocouples and a couple strain gauges that stop performing, that's okay. It's not. Uh, we have some redundancy building. It's not the end of the day. Uh, and it's really kind of going to be a building block process as we go. Uh, you know, we're not committing to flying anytime soon. We got to wait until we know we have a good answer to go fly. Um, we want to make sure we know the risk we have in front of us and not not have any unknown risks out there. Okay, well, <coughs> Mike Moses, uh, the Space Shuttle Program Launch Integration Manager. Thank you for uh, talking to us. Now we'll actually look to have you come on and summarize uh, what you've seen. Little. Uh, 
after the uh, the feeling part and the, when the final inspection team is uh, out doing its thing out on the launch pad uh, as before we wrap up our commentary this morning about 10:50 uh, a.m. we'll have you come back if you wouldn't mind and uh, see what you <laughs> what's been seen so far as you're building towards the direction of goodness as you said. Yeah, no problem. And I'll, I'll see if I can I can bend your ear even more with more data. I'm looking forward to it. All right, Mike, thank you for joining us. And again, well, uh, just uh, quickly recap: we are in the um, we uh, started the tanking test. The fueling process did begin on time at 7 a.m. Eastern. Uh, liquid hydrogen slow fill started at 7.12 a.m. And uh, we are currently at uh, in the simulated tanking test countdown at T-minus 5 hours, 12 minutes, and 15 seconds. We'll pause for a couple minutes and uh, give you more tanking test data in a few minutes. Uh, this is NASA Public Affairs at the Kennedy Space Center. This is NASA Public Affairs at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We're at T-minus 4 hours, 56 minutes, and 45 seconds in our tanking test countdown for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-133 mission to the International Space Station. Tanking test is where the launch team loads about 535,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into Discovery's external fuel tank, just as it would be done for a real launch attempt. The various parts of the tank are closely monitored, and the data is recorded from that. Filling the tank is known as tanking, and it takes about three hours to fill the 154-foot-tall external tank with the two super-cold propellants, which are used to fuel the shuttle's three main engines during the eight-and-a-half-minute climb into orbit. The start of the tanking test today started on time at 7 a.m. Eastern, and liquid oxygen fast fill started at 7.50 a.m., and one minute earlier, the liquid hydrogen fast fill began at 7.49 a.m. So this tanking test is going on schedule or slightly ahead for some of the uh, operations, which would put us uh, wrapping up the tanking process around 10 a.m. Eastern. The tanking test for, the, uh, for this particular day is designed to gather the most precise data ever about the movements and stresses and temperatures on the inner tank section of the shuttle's external tank, specifically on some of the 21-foot-long support beams that line the outside of the inner tank called stringers. There are 108 stringers around the entire inner tank. Getting a close-up look of that rib section that is the inner tank and where the, these, those ribs are the stringers. The dots you're looking at are actually uh, around where two of those stringers develop cracks. One of those cracks cracked the foam insulation on top of that stringer during tanking for Discovery's first launch attempt back on November 5th. Joining me here now in the uh, firing room number four in the launch control center, about three and a half miles away from Shuttle Discovery on launch pad 39A. I've got the so I wanted to walk us through a little more detail of, uh, uh, in particular, the, the what what the sensors will be uh, looking at today, and what uh, what the tanking test in particular will be. Uh, uh, the data that will be gathered for this uh, three hour long, and actually a longer process than that, the, the tanking process is three hours long with the entire test will uh, wrap up uh, mid-afternoon. Mid I've um, got Ali Mendoza here with me, the external tank and solid rocket booster vehicle manager here at Kennedy Space Center. Ali, thank you for uh, taking some time to talk to us. Good morning, Ali. Um, instead of having me go over uh, what, what, what's, what's <laughs> taking place today and all the sensors, I thought you could uh, kind of walk us through what... Uh, all the number of sensors that we have on there, what you're looking for, and uh, I guess we need to start off right away with um, um, a little more detail what, uh, about the test, the physical things that you did to get ready and that you're, you have that will be gathering the data for the, uh, the test today. Okay. Let's see. Um, I guess, as everybody knows, it's an instrumented tanking test, so it's a great opportunity to apply sensors, um, different types of instrumentation on the tank um, while we through the tanking test. Um, we have about 39 strain gauges on different areas of the tank, um, on, the, on the valleys, on the stringers, you know, the valleys being in between the two stringers. And then um, we also have 50 uh, thermocouples on there. And that's some of the cabling that we're looking at right now that uh, the, 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 the data is will come through that you strung underneath the foam? Uh, yes, what you're seeing there is the, gable, the cabling uh, harness that we went through. Um, with all these sensors that we put on there, it was approximately 162 wires that had to be routed from the two areas which we instrumented out through 
around the tank and back to the inner tank access arm so we can get it out to the main service structure so that all the data can be collected on their daily quarters. So it was about a 200 foot span of wire um, times 162. Hmm. <laughs> so it's a lot of soldering and a lot of work, really hard work. It was pretty impressive of our, of the, of our team out there. Done in a pretty short amount of time too, in the past week. Pull it all together, wasn't it really, essentially? Yes, it did. And the, the biggest challenge was the weather mm. while we were out there. Um, so, you know, the bonding of all these instrumentations onto the tank, onto a cryo surface. So um, it wasn't just a lick and stick type <laughs> operation. Um, you have to use some adhesives that, that take a lot of time to cure. And the temperature is always a big driver of how those cure times um, develop. So. so how did the engineers go about deciding what to monitor and what to look for to, to help the overall engineering analysis? Um, as was mentioned previously, you know, there's, there's a great deal of analysis, different types of analysis going on in the program. Um, a lot of it is, is trying to determine how the tank reacts under loading, under the cryogenic um, and, you know, flight conditions. Um, so s some of these gauges that we've put on there um, will determine temperature. For instance, how does the temperature increase and decrease during the tanking process? Um, the strain gauges will try and, and determine all the stresses and strains that the aluminum structure goes through as it's going through these thermal gradients and the weight of the fuel and you know the expansion thermal expansions of, of the tank itself and what that does to these stringers and one of the things that they're looking for is for instance the repaired area of the two stringers that we repaired um, about a month ago from the m from the previous uh, stringer crack from our launch attempt mm -hmm. um, you know how does that compare to a non repaired area so we attempt we put stringers on two different areas you know, instrumentation on two different areas, mm -hmm. one that was repaired, one that wasn't. Um, so this data also will help validate the models that we've been using for many years, saying that this is how we think the vehicle reacts during cryogenic temperatures. So it's a dual, you know, some of the many reasons about why this type of instrumentation was chosen and what the outcome would be. Well, you just uh, touched on it a second ago, um, talking about the repair work on two of those stringers that were done. Uh, if we could just step back to last month, um, early last month and uh, the middle of last month, do you mind going over a, a little bit of, of what was done uh, to get that repair process that was worked on the two stringers? Uh? Okay. I um, believe we do have some video that uh, going back about a month that shows some of that uh, stringer repair work. Yeah, one one of the first things that happens once once we detected the crack and a, a process to repair was developed, um, is you have to actually go in there and repair the foam that was there. Um, so the guys out there repaired, remove the foam so you can actual physical um, access to the stringers. What they did is a modification where they cut out the damaged portion of the stringers and they added on doublers and repaired that portion, added on a doubler, and then we go back in and replace the foam for flight. Um, and this in this particular instance that m involves spraying the foam under thermal conditions so the guys are out in an enclosure that's heated. At this time, you know, uh, there's certain very requ tight requirements for the actual spray operation, ambient and string, um, stringer uh, surface temperatures mm -hmm. so that they will have a proper adhesion and won't pop off during flight. Um, so, and then they'll trim that foam down to what it needs to be for flight conditions for the aerothermal loads and on ascent. And that was in some of the video we've seen in uh, live pictures. You see the different color of the foam because it hasn't been out in the sun. It hasn't basically got it in its tan. So you can see the, the area that's lighter is the it was the recently refoamed areas, and the obviously the darker uh, orange color is, is foam that was you know applied originally. Correct. Yeah. The the UV light will will change the color as well as just time. The, the foam will darken over time. So just kind of an overall perspective. We've, we've we're talking about a little bit. Uh, the, this morning, um, how, how long will this test basically take? What's your, your overall time frame for this test? Uh, when do you consider it officially over? When you know what? Uh, when do you stop gathering the data from the sensors and whatnot? Um, we should be uh, done with fueling, just tanking and filling a, a f and fill by about 10 o'clock this morning or so. The data gathering effort, though, will continue. Um, what they're going to look, we're going to continue to gather data through drain. So post tanking, as we drain the fuel off the vehicle, the fuel and the ox, um, we'll continue to gather those that data to see how the the tank reacts after fueling um, a lot of it is the temperature so we're actually going to the temperature we were hoping to record data all the way through until the tank re becomes ambient so that could be at least 24 hours of data as long as we you know as much data as we can um, for the models so you'll be gathering data even well after draining it and and well into the weekend apparently 
Right. Yeah. So we want to validate, you know, how long one of the one of the analysis, you know, that they're looking at is how long does it take for these thermal gradients on this tank once you load and, and how what it does to the actual, you know, large vessels. Um, mm -hmm. So how long does it take to go ambient, fully ambient? It's one of those questions. <laughs> well, well, our commentary will obviously not go that long because <laughs> it's on the air for that amount of time. Um, we actually, uh, as you mentioned, you've, there are um, uh, 39 strain gauges um, that record the pressure of the stresses on the uh, tank. And I think you have, I hope that's what it is, um, you've got uh, with you uh, uh, some basically what uh, these, these, these gauges, what they are, and unfortunately you just dropped one. <laughs> that's why you dropped out of the camera <laughs> shot, okay? <laughs> They're very um, small. <laughs> so if you, if you just uh, actually stand up and hold this, uh, basically very, mm -hmm. very tiny, looks like a microchip slip essentially is what it is We're, yeah what correct it looks like so what it, th this uh, these are ad adhered to the tank correct these are these are stuck to the tank with some adhesive and what you have is it's it's really a, a wire you know couple wires up on a, a a strip of of tape that come on to the thing and then there's these tiny wires that extend from the actual strain gauge now these are the small wires that will be soldered to all the shielded cable runs that you see down through the tank. So of these, we have you know 39 of these um, placed on the tank right now. And thermocouples are much smaller than this. Really? Yes, they're even smaller. So I don't have any, but it's much smaller, and it's only one wire coming out of each thermocouple, and those are also soldered. And the reason we had to go to a shielded wire cabling and cable run is because you have a, no a lot of noise out there, what we call in the electrical world. You know, it's all the antennas that are out there will d can can um, can play with what the signals are, the noise, and, and so it's hard to determine later. So the shielded cables, you know, kind of drowns out all that information, so you can get a clear a clear data point from each one of these wires. And they'll be collecting from each one of these wires um, as we go, you know, various data points per second. Hmm. So the amount of data and number crunching that'll happen post-flight, you know, post-tanking is going to be, a, you know, a great effort by the analysis guys. In the, in the, the multiple terabyte range is what I think Mike Moses said earlier. Oh, yes. A <laughs> lot of data. <laughs> a lot of data. Um, now, in addition to the, the sensors and the, and the uh, cabling you uh, talked about and the dots, so we, we'll get to that in a second. Um, we had actually had some questions about the dots, and uh, I probably, uh, actually, let me get to that right away. Um, Mike Moses jokingly said that uh, we had uh, engineers out there sort of finger painting, basically putting these you know thousands of dots on the on the tank, and you can see in the upper left hand corner of the screen there uh, a, a, s a section where the stringers were repaired. That section of the uh, of the dots, uh, how did they, they were manually put on by you know, put on by hand? How were they put on? Was it Yes, it's actually, you weren't far from it. Finger painting is what you can <laughs> call it. Um, it actu they actually had to be performed by a certified technician, though. There is a certain amount of pressure that can only be placed on the tank surface, um, or else you crush the foam. So there is a certification, and our certified techs um, know how much pressure that is. But they were pretty much with a gloved hand applying their finger into, into paint and actually putting small dots on the tank. How about that? Um, it took about two shifts, and unfortunately with the time frame, how it happened, it was on second and third shift when our temperatures were down in the, the 30s early, you're right, yeah, early degrees. This week. There mm -hmm. wasn't an enclosure around them, so they were out in the wind and the cold. So they were little chatterboxes by the time <laughs> they, were, they were finished. Um, but what you're looking at is, is pretty much um, three to four dots almost per square inch. So um, the numbers fluctuate on how many dots were actually there. But if you do the math, it's, it was at least about 10 to 12,000 dots. And anyone's welcome to count <laughs> to <laughs> let us know. Um, we didn't um, at that point. I guess that's another contest that public affairs could run if we, we tried. So you, you'll you use these 3D um, high-fidelity cameras to look at any of the movements. And since these dots are not uh, they're asymmetrical. They're not. You know. They're not uniform. That's supposed to help you with this this particular process you guys are using to, to monitor this section. Uh, yes. This is a. It's called an Aramis system. And it's uh, by a company named Trillion. So they they their system actually is going to detect any displacement on on the tank surface. Um, they're looking. What we're looking for is any shrinkage um, type displacements. Is when I when I mention displacements, that's what I mean. Any deformation in the flange, which is the area that connects the LOX tank to that inner tank, um, which is that, that horizontal um, lighter foam that you see that area. So if there's any deformation or any movement that, you know, they're hoping that the distance between dots and how close they are, that, that's kind of what they're looking at with the stereo imaging. Um, so it's like a 3D visualization imaging of 
of all these dots. And so it'll become a pattern that they can look at and detect. And they also will look at any strains that are detected there. And what th we'll tell them is how close those dots and how those dots deform um, would pretty much give them, you know, the analysis. And it's also, again, a 3D analysis. They'll be taking multiple data points and bringing this back into their, their systems. How many people were involved in preparing for the tanking test? Oh, goodness. Um, Roughly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, what you have is pretty much the tanking test. We, we are doing it in a flight configuration, as close to flight as possible. Um, so from our part perspective, it's, it's pretty much the same team. And now you add all the analysis teams that are going out around through the country. Um, for instance, just for the dots, there were folks from Glenn Research Center, from Johnson Space Center, from Kennedy Space Center, from the Lockheed Martin folks at Michoud and the Lockheed Martin folks and NASA folks at Marshall. Uh, space Flight Center. Um, so you're, it's, you're in the hundreds um, just to prepare and develop the analysis um, to try and, and find what is it that we need to determine from this tanking test. Um, and that's not just for the, f the stringer, but also for the GUP. Um, also, there's another team off looking at the GUP and everything that needs to happen there um, for, for information. And the <coughs> this is a video from inside fire room number four here in the Launch Control Center that uh, some of the teams are there are working this tanking test right now, and we'll be uh, talking to uh, the shuttle launch director, Mike uh, uh, Leinbach, shortly to uh, a little more detail about uh, the, the launch control center team and the people who are, are supporting this tanking test. Um, one other quick question before I let you go um, related. We have all the tanks that, uh, that the space shuttle program has. They're all here at Kennedy Space Center, and uh, in fact, the, the, there's one out on launch pad 39A that we're looking at right now on Discovery, and the other two are inside the vehicle assembly building right next door to us. Um, what, uh, what's been done to them related to the stringer issue? Okay, yeah, that's what, actually one thing I didn't touch up on. Um, we did perform NDE, non-destructive analysis, which is pretty much x-ray imaging of the tank out at the pad um, for the LOX flange and the, LA, the hydrogen flange. Um, we used two different types of imagery. We used um, computed radi radiography, which is pretty much an x-ray, but it's a digital x-ray. So it's, it's a the processing is more of a digital, digitized process versus a film that mm -hmm. you could actually pick up and look at. Um, and we also did backscatter, which is a, a much finer um, method to laser scan imaging that we do, and we did that at the LH2 flange. And that bounces the, radi the, the radiation off the tank itself, and then it comes back to the to the Correct, scanner. into an imaging. It yeah. takes a little longer because it, it's, it's like kind of like it's a little scan, that little laser scan comes throughout the entire um, area that you're imaging and then it processes it digitized and then you move the equipment over to the next stringer. Um, so it took us a few, you know, a few days out there mm -hmm. to get all this scanning done. So what we did is the two tanks that we have in the VAB, we brought over the CR equipment, the computed radiography, and we performed that on the LO2 flange and the VAB on both tanks. And we went all the way 360 degrees around and what we were trying to do is determine if there was any gross cracks or defects that are pre-existing um, on the tank. Mm -hmm. Um, and we will be doing the same after tanking. The one that we're going to just we're just tanking today. When it comes back to the VAB, we will NDE um, that tank as well. And right. we're looking at even possibly, are there any better ways to image the tank? So a lot of that analysis is also going on. If there's another technology that we can use that can give us even detection of even smaller defects. And, and of the two tanks that are inside the vehicle assembly building right now, being prepared for Endeavor and uh, and, and Atlantis, um, were any abnormalities found, anything, uh, any defects found in the, the scans? No, nothing was found with the, with the, um, the CR technology that we used 100 degrees around. And that at least gives you a baseline, at least right now, without putting a cryogenic load, without putting the super cold propellants inside of it like it happened to Discovery's tank, at least gives you a baseline, right, of, of Correct. what it's you're dealing with? Correct. a baseline that from the, from the fact manufacturing facility, there are no gross defects in the tank right now. Okay, well, um, I, I that gives us at least a good picture of where we are right now on this taking test and what uh, I think lies ahead for us in the next uh, few weeks and over the holidays and uh, into next month for, uh, for Discovery's tank. Um, Ali Mendoza, thank you for uh, taking a few minutes to talk to us and walk us through the, uh, today's tanking test. And, uh, well, I wish you good luck with, uh, with everything today. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> Great to be here. Again, Ali, it's uh, Ali Mendoza. She's the, um, the external tank and solid rocket booster vehicle manager here at Kennedy Space Center. Um, we are, uh, just to go over some numbers, the tanking test did start on time at 7 a.m. Eastern time. Um, we went into the fast fill for liquid oxygen at, uh, at, uh, at 7.50 a.m. Eastern, and then uh, the liquid hydrogen fast fill began about a minute earlier at 7.49 a.m. Eastern. Um, also during this time, uh, about uh, quarter to eight, uh, 
we, the liquid hydrogen eco sensors um, went through their test. Uh, it means that the tank was about 5% uh, on the liquid hydrogen side filled. The, uh, no problems were detected there. Uh, it's an issue we had back uh, a couple of years ago with uh, those particular sensors not working. Um, the, uh, the just to, get, to briefly go over what the eco sensors are, the uh, liquid hydrogen part of the tank, um, uh, when it's about 5% full, there's a low-level engine cutoff sensor um, known as an eco sensor, and at the bottom of the tank, and uh, it gets covered over by the, the liquid hydrogen to test to make sure that those uh, all four sensors are working properly. The uh, computer is order the sensors to command their drive um, when they actually obviously are wet. This um, will be continued to monitor throughout the tanking process as it always is for even for a real launch. Um, the eco sensors act as one of the shuttle's low fuel warning systems and in a worst case scenario would shut down the shuttle's engine. Uh, the, the engine, if they, for some reason, were to be unexpectedly low on fuel, there's a fuel leak or something. Uh, the space shuttle program did have, as I mentioned, problems with this back in uh, 2008, um, but uh, they have put a repair method in place and have not seen any issues with them since and uh, we don't expect to see any of them uh, during this uh, tanking test or even for the uh, next launch attempt for Discovery. So um, again right now we're, uh, we're about uh, one hour and uh, 23 minutes into this tanking test for Space Shuttle Discovery which did start on time at 7 a.m. Liquid oxygen fast fill began at 7.50 a.m. and liquid hydrogen fast fill began at 7.49 a.m. Uh, the overall fueling process should wrap up about 10 a.m. Eastern. But as um, we just heard Ellie Mendoza mention a couple minutes ago, uh, the tanking test itself essentially will be uh, still gathering data well until tomorrow, um, even after the tank is drained and they are still getting temperature and, and uh, strain gauge pressure readings from the, uh, the, the 89 sensors that are on the tank. As the uh, tank cools and gets to the ambient air temperature out in launch pad 39A, uh, along Florida's central east coast. So at uh, in this tanking test countdown, we're at T-minus 4 hours, 35 minutes, and 35 seconds. This is NASA Public Affairs. This is NASA Public Affairs at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We're at T-minus 4 hours, 21 minutes, and 55 seconds in our tanking test countdown for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-133 mission to the International Space Station. This tanking test is where the launch team loads about 535,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into Discovery's external fuel tank, just as it would be during a real launch attempt, and various parts of the tank are being closely monitored and data is being recorded. The filling of the tank is known as tanking, and it takes about three hours for that uh, entire process to be complete. We did start tanking on time at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. The liquid hydrogen fast fill began at 7.49 a.m., and liquid oxygen fast fill began at 7.50 a.m. Just a couple of minutes ago we were uh, the oxygen portion was about 35 percent filled up and the liquid hydrogen section was about 65 percent filled up. Currently they're uh, not monitoring any issues or problems associated with the tanking test. There have not uh, there been no cracks seen in the, in the foam insulation at this point. Nothing has been uh, out of the ordinary. There's been no issues with the to this point, the ground umbilical carrier plate, and that, also known as the GUP, that particular um, piece of hardware is what caused our launch scrub back on November 5th. And then, of course, the foam insulation cracks on the uh, inner tank area were discovered afterwards and uh, leads us to where we are right now. And joining us here in the launch control center in fire room number four is... Uh, Tony Bartolone, he's the lead external tank and solid rocket booster project engineer. Tony, thank you for taking a couple minutes to talk to us, and specifically about the uh, the GUP, and uh, actually what that is what led us to to uh, to scrub back in early November. But uh, it's not what's uh, keeping us on the ground at the moment. Now, uh, good morning, Allard, and uh, that's correct. Uh, back on November 5th, we did have a, an off-scale high uh, leak of hydrogen coming from the ground umbilical carrier plate. Uh, that did uh, violate our launch commit criteria and uh, forced us into a scrub. Um, we've had had uh, instances of like like that uh, leak uh, re in the recent past. Uh, we uh, we had some ideas about what may be uh, contributing to that, and that uh, kicked off an investigation that followed thereafter. So let's see if we can just back up for half a second and go into what exactly is 
a GUP. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, uh, the GUP stands for Ground Umbilical Carrier Plate. It's uh, a steel plate that's uh, on the side of the external tank uh, that attaches to um, uh, what we call the flight half or the flight plate, um, where the, uh, the vent line comes off the top of the hydrogen tank and allows us to vent off uh, gaseous hydrogen, gaseous helium uh, out through the, um, the, the GUP into the ground vent line and so that uh, excess hydrogen can be burnt off. And we're actually now looking at uh, video from... Uh, the GUP right now, they're looking at the, uh, the access arm that you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, that, um, uh, and this is a, <coughs> excuse me, a closer look at the, uh, the GUP area, and it, and it has some additional uh, dots around it that we don't normally see during a, a tanking process. What are those? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we went and put some ink dots on uh, the inner tank foam that you see there, and as well as some on the actual carrier plate itself. Um, those are being used and tracked with a high-definition video camera to see if we can detect any motion in the carrier plate uh, when the vent valve cycles and um, the, uh, the slug of, uh, of hydrogen gas passes through there. So we're looking to see if there's any kind of relative movement between those dots to see if we can learn a little bit more about uh, the dynamics of the carrier plate during venting. Uh, unlike uh, the, the, these particular alignment dots as you uh, were put on, I, I believe by a permanent magic marker as opposed to actually being hand put on like the uh, the other uh, dots that we're, we're using for the stringer sections. Yeah, that's correct. And it's a little bit different process and, and obviously different equipment that we're using to look at it. So, um, But the, the principle is the same. You want to have a, something in the field of view that you can use to give you measurements, and, and that's exactly what the, those dots are providing for us. Now, I believe we have, if we go back, um, uh, we have some video of this. Uh, back the the actual repair process took place in uh, early to, to mid November and uh, the Gulf really just been kind of waiting until uh, until now for, for a tanking test uh, yeah we uh, we immediately went into that investigation I mentioned earlier um, and uh, we set up a, a plan for a forensic disassembly uh, taking a, a whole slew of measurements throughout the process uh, we ended up actually changing the carrier plate as you can see in the video there um, and once we got that carrier plate reset and everything, um, uh, the new power bolt installed and everything uh, set up the way we wanted it, um, we began a series of measurements called concentricity measurements to verify that the opening in the plate indeed was as, li as aligned as possible with the opening in the actual external tank. Um, throughout that process, though, we, we actually came to learn um, we were not controlling a, a variable that uh, uh, was very important, and that was the concentricity of the actual QD itself. And uh, what we're just looking at here is actually the uh, interior of the uh, inner tank area, which they show on the very top of the tank there, and this is the quick disconnect you were talking about. Yeah, that's correct. And you can see the, the quick disconnect and as it's being mounted there to the carrier plate. Um, that interface that, that uh, at the very nose of that uh, quick disconnect and where that actually lands on the seal uh, is, a, is a measurement that we hadn't been controlling before. We felt that uh, our, our previous process felt that the, um, uh, the plate, as long as it was aligned, would give you good alignment of the QD. It turns out that each QD is a little bit different. Uh, some have certain uh, attributes that make them uh, kind of pull the, uh, or, or, or put a load into the seal in the direction that we know that the vent line moves, and uh, that's in the direction of badness. And so we <laughs> went through painstaking efforts to, um, to select a QD and to install it a, a certain way so that we could actually move what we call the, the concentricity in the direction of goodness away from the, the relative motion that the vent arm puts into the system. And when you're talking about a, a proper alignment, this is, this is, I mean, really, really proper alignment. <laughs> Yeah, th this is, you know, this is space, space flight business, you know, we're, we're talking about tolerances in the thousandths of an inch and temperatures down to the minus 423 degree range of, of hydrogen. So, you know, uh, the near perfect isn't perfect enough. Hmm. So we, uh, we learned quite a bit here and we believe that we've, uh, we've got a process now and thankfully everything's been going extremely smooth today. No indications of a leak so far and uh, the tank is, is about 65, 70% full now, and we're, we're doing real well. We're real, we're real pleased with how uh, everything tur is turning out today. So, again, without presupposing what's going to happen, but and you pretty much touched on it, though. You engineers believe you have, you're pretty confident this is that you really do have the proper alignment, and this really is the, the fix, because last year it seemed like we had gotten, you know, past the GUP issue, and, it, and you guys had properly aligned it and, and shored up, you know, shimmed it up and then put those blocks underneath, and, and you've got a proper alignment of the plate itself, and that took care of the, the problem up till, till last month, actually. Yeah, that's right. Um, on STS-127, we had a, a similar leak to what had happened here, and we had gone through, and actually, when, that's when we first learned about concentricity um, and the concentricity of the plate, the opening in the plate versus the opening in the external tank. 
Um, but at that time, we never really considered the quick disconnect and its contribution to concentricity. Um, so that's where we, we went off and focused on that process uh, uh, with this investigation. And uh, that's a significant variable that, that uh, we hadn't been controlling for before. And we, we think that, you know, there, well, we, we've measured that there's some quick disconnects that automatically put us outside of our requirement window. So depending on which one was picked off the shelf and decided to be used for a particular stack, then we may have, end up, have ended up uh, uh, putting in that condition from the very beginning. And so now, knowing what we know, we can avoid that. So that's, that would be the plan to, <coughs> obviously, we've been joking about this with Mike Moses earlier, that, uh, that you've, you've, if, again, GUP doesn't leak. That's good. It's a successful test of at least this portion. Now you're going to have to disconnect it, <laughs> take it back into the vehicle assembly building, only to have to do it all over again. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know what we need to demonstrate here is that it's a repeatable process, and we believe that everything that we've uh, learned to date and, and uh, uh, incorporated into our uh, revised procedures is going to make it so that we can certainly repeat uh, uh, the perfect or near-perfect installation. And what this video, just as a, right before we uh, let you go, is uh, that is actually the flare stack, where the, the end line of that, that uh, vent pipe we were talking about. It's a little easier to see in the, in the nighttime, but... Uh, uh, that, uh, much like a, an oil refinery burning off the excess gas, it's the same thing. This is burning off the excess hydrogen, like you mentioned. And, uh, and we get this question all the time, especially in, in when we were launching a, a nighttime launch. That, oh, goodness, the <laughs> shuttle is on fire. No, that's, that fire is on purpose. That's, uh, it, it's doing its job. And, uh, okay, well, if, um, again, like you said, uh, we're, we're getting near filled the tank so far. So, so good with uh, the GUP and the GUP repair. And, uh, I wish you luck for the rest of the uh, tanking test, and next time we make an actual launch attempt. <laughs> Thank you, Al. It's been a pleasure. Again, Tony Bartolone, the lead uh, external tank and solid rocket booster project engineer here at uh, Kennedy Space Center, walking us through the, the ground umbilical carrier plate and the repair process that took place um, for that particular piece of hardware that uh, actually caused Discovery's first launch attempt on November 5th to be scrubbed. And uh, again, like I said, so far so good. Today we have not seen any leak in that area, and... Uh, haven't seen any other issues uh, related to these stringers uh, that we saw during the tanking process back on November 5th as well. So um, the countdown is uh, in, the, in this tanking simulation, is, uh, I'm sorry, tanking countdown simulation is uh, proceeding on schedule. And uh, just to recap, the tanking process did start on time at 7 a.m. Eastern, and the, we went into liquid hydrogen fast fill at 7.49 a.m. and liquid oxygen fast fill at 7.50 a.m. And we are about uh, roughly about... A, an hour and 48 minutes into the, the tanking process. So at uh, T minus four hours, 11 minutes and 40 seconds in this tanking test countdown, this is NASA Public Affairs. This is NASA Public Affairs at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We are at T minus three hours, 25 minutes, and 10 seconds in our tanking test countdown for Space Shuttle Discovery's SCS-133 mission to the International Space Station. The tanking test is where the launch team loads about 535,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into Discovery's external tank, just as it would be done on a real launch attempt, and various parts of the tank will be closely monitored and data is being recorded. Filling the tank is a procedure known as tanking, and it does take about three hours to fill the 154-foot tall external tank with the two super cold propellants. That process did start on time at 7 a.m. Eastern. We went into uh, what's known as stable replenish for liquid hydrogen at 9.28 a.m. Eastern. And the liquid oxygen side of the tank went into uh, fast fill at 7.50 a.m. and is currently about, nine, about 88 percent full. So we're getting very close to finishing up the tanking process. Um, joining us now in the launch control center Fire room number four, about three and a half miles from where Space Shuttle Discovery is sitting on launch pad 39A, is the Shuttle Launch Director, Mike Leinbach, who's going to uh, take a couple minutes, and thank you for joining us, uh, to uh, walk us through, it feels like a launch day, sort of, kind of, but there's definitely something missing. <laughs> well, there's a lot missing today, and we don't have any astronauts to begin with. Good point. <laughs> That's right. No astronauts today, but uh, everything's going extremely well. As you say, we got into tanking on time, and... Uh, processing through the, the standard tanking procedure. We're not doing anything different to fill up the tank today. And um, everything's going really, really well. You heard that the ground umbilical carrier plate is working fine. No leaks there. That was one of our major objectives, and that's, that guy's performing perfectly fine now. We haven't seen any any issues with the foam. Uh, we've, we've talked to the guys looking at the sensors. The, the 
hundred or so sensors on the tank, and the data is being processed right now. Uh, too early to, to make, draw any conclusions, of course, but uh, we're getting great data from the tank right now. And uh, so we're, we're pressing on. We're, we feel good about it. Um, it does not feel like a launch, though, I have to admit. We don't have uh, the full mesh management team with us today. We don't have the, the very important people that sit in the other bubble right next to us. We do have every console represented, though. All of the systems on board the orbiter, the tank, and the boosters, and the ground systems uh, have at least one person with us today in case we get into a situation where we want to talk about an integrated problem, which we haven't had to yet. But uh, even though there are some systems that are not powered up, we, we wanted to have uh, all systems represented in the firing room today. So from that perspective, it, it feels a little bit like launch, but, uh, you know, it's a test, and that's hmm. okay. We're doing what we need to do today to, to prove out the tank and, and uh, then go study that data and get ready to fly. So, again, in rough, rough ballpark numbers. So you've got basically mo he said most teams represented here, at least by an individual. Yep. yep. So yep. the couple, less than a couple hundred people in the Fire rooms and, and support rooms? Well, normally on, on launch day, we'd have about 180 people here in firing room four with us. And um, today it's probably on the order of, of 80 or so, something like that. Of course, full teams for the li liquid oxygen guys, uh, the hydrogen guys, the, the engines and the main propulsion system, they're all fully represented today. Integration console, of course. But, uh, you know, some of the others, COM and, and APU, and, and uh, since we're not producing any hydraulic power today, we don't need the hydraulic engineers, right. that type of thing. So. But again, we have at least one of those guys down there in case we want to talk to them. And then in firing room two, our backup firing room, that's probably about the same posture, about about half strength today. But uh, uh, again, everybody we need to, to conduct this test for sure. So you're, we're in, I've been calling it, you know, it's, it's a tanking test countdown. It's a modified countdown. You started it on Wednesday. It's, uh, if you just go through a little bit how, you know, it's close to it, as close as you can make practical, but obviously not a real full countdown. Yeah, it, uh, it, um, the final six hours from beginning and tanking on is, is very close to the, to the standard countdown, obviously without some of the major, major components. Um, but uh, the loading sequence is all the same. We're going to do the, the full inspection with the final inspection team, our ICE team. We'll send them out to the pad uh, here in about a half hour or so, something like that. A little bit of an augmented team, and I know Charlie Blackwell Thompson is going to talk to you more about that, so I'll let, I'll let her do that. Um, but no, we're going to get a full inspection of the tank. Uh, we'll get ready to drain. We'll drain. Uh, we'll go all the way down to uh, T minus 31 seconds and hold there. We want to pressurize the tanks, which we do after five minutes and counting. Pressurize the hydrogen tank and then the liquid oxygen tank. So we'll get down to flight pressurization um, and hold at 31 seconds for a couple of minutes or so, something like that. And then we'll call cutoff and uh, get into our drain sequence from there. So some major deltas, but uh, the loading sequence itself is, is very standard for us. And, um, again, everything's going fine right now. And as we learned earlier, it's uh, the test technically isn't even over when you, after you drain the tanks. It's still going to be going on, essentially. Well, that's right. Part of that is, is due to the all, all the sensors we have on the tank. We want to make sure that as those sensors warm back up uh, due to ambient condition, that we see those temperatures rise on those sensors, and it's able, we're able then to characterize the data we get at the super cold temperatures better as well. So we'll be recording data well into the evening tonight and probably into into tomorrow sometime. Now you kind of touched on it earlier. This, uh, you're obviously all professionals and, and that being said, this isn't, a, you know, you're not tanking for a real launch and uh, it, it is the, and of course you take it seriously, but is there less pressure knowing that you're not trying to get ready to safely put Seven, you know, six people into into space. So, is it, you know, I mean, how do you guys go about approaching a test versus an actual launch day? Well, that's that's part of the thing we wanted to talk to to the team about in the pre-test briefing a couple of days ago was was the importance of this test and and to uh, and to really treat it almost like a launch day. I mean, it's a, it's a very very serious test. It's a very hazardous test. We've taken all the same precautions we do on launch day with the ground crews that we're going to be sending out shortly. Um, but, you know, it's not launch. It, 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 uh, it, it feels different. It, it sure does. It, it, uh, it just doesn't have the same feel as on launch day. It, um, it's hard to describe the feeling on launch day unless you've been in here, and especially here in the control room, where the, where the, the feeling is, is, is unlike any other. I mean, you get, this, you get a feeling in your stomach like we're about ready to send seven astronauts into orbit, six on this particular mission coming up. And uh, that's a tremendous feeling, and uh, we take that obviously very seriously. We're taking today very seriously too, because we need to get this data for the engineers and, and to go try to figure out why those why that string are cracked the way it did. Um, but no, it's a different feel today, sure, and that's fine. It it uh, 
we feel good about the test, and we're running it per our procedure. Spend a lot of time developing the procedure. Um, the software that we do um, uh, for this test versus a standard countdown, you know, we had to take some of the software subsequences out of the out of the ground processing software because we're not rotating the, we're not going to swing the orbiter axis arm back, for instance. Obviously, we're going to leave that extended. And so those things that we change in the software, we had to validate those in our software procedures and, and uh, our processing facility. And so we've done all that. We've done all good training for this. Um, we're, we're obviously ready to go. It's going fine right now. Right. All right. Mike, thank you for taking a couple minutes to walk us through how it's like a launch day, but not like a launch day. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking forward to the real thing. Right. And hopefully in early February we'll do that. Excellent. All right. Good luck with the rest of the uh, testing, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, again, that was Mike Leinbach, the uh, shuttle launch director, who uh, walked us through the differences between uh, the tanking test and what we normally see on a, on a launch day. And um, like he did say, we are uh, the engineers are not seeing any issues right now related to either the ground umbilical carrier plate, which actually caused the scrub on the first uh, first launch attempt for Discovery back on November 5th. The uh, no leaking issues there, and there's no uh, obvious signs of uh, cracks or anything uh, anything obvious uh, at the moment uh, being seen related to the uh, the inner tank and the foam insulation and the cracks that were seen on November 5th that uh, put us in the situation where we are now having to have this tanking test. So um, at this point, we uh, did, again, just to re recap time-wise, we did uh, go into stable replenish on the liquid hydrogen side at 9.28 a.m. Eastern. Um, we're getting very close to finishing up the... Uh, tanking process. The liquid oxygen side is um, nearing its 100% uh, uh, getting near its stable replenish status and uh, tanking should be wrapping up in the uh, next 15-20 minutes or so and as uh, Mike Leinbach said that we then we uh, dispatching the final in the, um, the final inspection team also known as the ICE team. They will be uh, typically it's a, a uh, seven-person crew. This time it'll be a, an eight-person crew. We'll be doing a little extra things related to this tanking test, and uh, we'll get a little more detail when the uh, when the crew actually is uh, put out to the pad, uh, allowed to, to access the pad after we've reached uh, uh, the end of the fueling process, which did start on time at 7 a.m. Eastern time, and uh, like I said, we're getting very close to wrapping that up. So at, uh, in this, this tanking test countdown, we're at T minus three hours, 15 minutes, and 40 seconds. We'll be stopping at uh, the T-minus three-hour point um, for an hour built-in hold, similar to what goes on on a normal launch day, but not uh, not the typical, usually two-and-a-half-hour built-in hold that uh, that uh, occurs at that time. Uh, as uh, Mike Leinbach said, there are doing some, some differences and uh, some things are not uh, going exactly the way this, this modified countdown is... Uh, is similar but not exactly the same as uh, you'd have for a real launch countdown, but, but enough at least in the last uh, six hours or so that uh, allows engineers and technicians to get the data that are required for this tanking test, get us back into a situation where we can be ready to launch Discovery on its real attempt to the International Space Station as opposed to just a tanking test. So at uh, T-minus three hours, 14 minutes, and 50 seconds, this is NASA Public Affairs. First, First off, we're headed yeah. right to 255. Okay. Doug? Tank's dry, so the frost balls we got probably won't wash away, at least not until it warms up significantly and, it, you know, we get a little moisture on the tank. You need me help getting the shots, and then later we'll, uh, we'll be moving the camera over in front of the orbiter. So we'll be, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be moving the whole assembly, but he'll come back and give me a hand moving that around. NTD, final inspection team on direct seven. I've got you loud and clear, and I want to tell you that we're assembled, and we've done our uh, pre-test safety briefing, and we're ready to go to the pad when you uh, send us.
This is NASA Public Affairs at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We're at T minus three hours in holding in this tanking test countdown for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS 133 mission to the International Space Station. Currently, there is 26 minutes and 10 seconds remaining in this one hour built in hold, in this tanking test countdown. Tanking process is over, and the final inspection team is now at launch pad 39A doing its walk down of tanking started on time at 7 a.m. Eastern time and concluded at 9.59 a.m. Eastern. The final inspection team was given the okay at 10.04 a.m. to head out to the pad and begin its, its portion of the tanking test walk down. Joining us now here in the fire room number four of the launch control center, about three and a half miles away from Discovery on its launch pad. I have Charlie Blackwell Thompson, who is the NASA test director, and uh, taking a couple minutes to talk to us about uh, how the test went this morning how, so far. I know you've got a, another whole day to go before you, you wrap it up, but how did, how did things go so far this morning? Well, uh, thanks for having me, Allard. Let's say this morning things went really well. We got into tanking right at 7 o'clock when we uh, gave a go for both the loading of both the commodities for liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Um, had no issues at all during the tanking and got both commodities in to replenish right at 10 o'clock. Uh, one of the things that we were watching, as I'm sure uh, you were and many others uh, across the country and in this firing room, was as we uh, got uh, toward uh, topping on the hydrogen tank, we were certainly looking at uh, at the GUP and its performance and, and everything worked perfectly and we didn't see any leaks there so that's a good news story for us and one of the objectives of this test so certainly glad to have that behind us um, other than that we had no issues during tanking at all um, everything went very well we'll continue to collect data on this tank and the, the folks will go and review that and then we'll have some report outs on that and and see what we learned as a result of the test now um the final inspection team is doing its uh, its walk down to the pad right now, but it's a slightly augmented team. And you can see them out there on launch pad 39A uh, right now. Um, just walk us through what uh, what they're walking through. <laughs> Well, it's a fairly standard uh, inspection for them, the, very similar to what we do on launch day. A little bit different this time around. Uh, we do have eight, eight people on the final inspection team. Normally it's a seven-person team, and we have that extra members out there to actually operate a, uh, a telescope. Um, we have a 21 megapixel camera that will be uh, mounted to that telescope, and really the purpose of that is just to give us a little bit better, more detailed, closer up view of the tank. So as we take a look at the tank and its performance during this inspection, uh, we'll just get a little bit closer and a little bit better views this time around, and we have an extra person dedicated to the operation of that telescope. And you'll be able to see that once they get down to the zero level, you'll see the use of that telescope at that time. Now, you said it's pretty standard. Um, Obviously, the area of focus really has been around the inner tank area, the, the rib portion around the stringers. Are they doing anything, spending a little more time looking at that area, or is it really just is what would be a standard walk down like you would see on, an, on a typical launch day? Well, it's a fairly standard launch, uh, walk down like we have on launch day. Certainly, uh, we have a little bit of extra time uh, allocated, and the folks will be taking a closer look uh, at the tank. But we do a very thorough inspection on launch day, and so we would expect that it'll be that same level of inspection. Again, we have uh, this, the telescope and, and this camera th that gives us a little bit better resolution, a little bit better views. And so we'll be uh, using those tools, but um, it's not a, a great deal different than what we would expect to have on launch day. And the idea, I guess, behind that is that you you want to make sure that you're not missing anything that you aren't looking for. If you're focusing on the inner tank, then you might miss something else. So therefore, they, that's why they're doing sort of a standard inspection. Yes, sir. That's correct. And uh, kind of alluded to it when you first uh, joined us, technically with with fueling being over, and yes, you, you, this afternoon you guys will get into the... Uh, um, actually, if you just walk us through what, you know, the, what the rest of the major milestones for this modified content will be, if you, if you would. Certainly. Well, you mentioned that we have uh, a little over 20 minutes left on our hold here at T-minus three hours. Uh, the final inspection team will uh, continue coming down the stack. Uh, they'll, they initially went up to the 255-foot level, and then to the 215. Um, they'll come down to the 195, the 135, and then down to the 95-foot level. Again, continuing their uh, standard inspection. And, um, and they'll be sending their data and their pictures back to the firing room just as they do on launch day, and then they'll do their report out uh, once they get back here what their findings were. 
That takes us, uh, countdown clock will pick up and begin counting right around uh, 11 o'clock, and we'll count down to our standard hold point at T-minus 20 minutes. We have a 10-minute built-in hold at 20. Uh, you probably recall, just like on launch day, that's when we uh, make all of our preparations for transitioning the uh, onboard uh, computers from the ground format mode into an ascent uh, telemetry format mode, and so we'll transition the, the computers at that point. Uh, count down to T-minus nine minutes, so we have a 10-minute hold built in at nine. Uh, we'll make sure that, um, again, pretty standard between 20 and nine, just like on launch day, and I think Mike talked a little bit about, Mike Leinbach, that we had some systems that are not configured for the tanking test, so there's, there's a few deltas. But for the most part, uh, standard countdown from 20 to 9. We'll get down to 9. We'll hold for a quick 10 minutes on launch day. That's a 40-minute hold. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll make sure that the team is ready to pick up from 9, and then we'll count down to, um, to 31 seconds where we'll hold. And the idea from going from 9 down to 31 and doing that final terminal portion of count is so that we can get the, uh, the tank to flight pressure and, uh, again, take a look at the performance when we're at the flight pressures. So then we'll hold at 31 seconds once we have... Uh, uh, once we're ready, we'll go ahead and go through what we call cutoff, which is uh, similar to what you hear on launch day. And, uh, well, we actually hope not to hear it on launch <laughs> day, but, but when we scrub. Uh, which which we did last time, so yes. <laughs> yeah, or in the event that we have an issue, um, the same words will be used, and then we'll go through our standard uh, recycle control. And, uh, and, and it's pretty standard from that, on, that point on. But for us, uh, from a countdown perspective, uh, it looks very similar from, from where we are now all the way down through count, except, of course, there's, there's no launch at the <laughs> end, which is... Uh, the payoff. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not quite as fun, but, um, but certainly we're very, uh, very excited about meeting the objectives of this test. Which, and apparently that will continue even after you've started draining the tank, half an hour after you cut off you're going to uh, continue using those sensors, strain gauge and temperature sensors, right, until uh, tomorrow, basically. Yes, that is true. We'll uh, continue looking at this data. We'll get through, uh, we'll get through drained. Currently, that's scheduled for about uh, 1,700. Just before 5 p.m., we should be through our drain operations, and then we'll continue taking data on these sensors until we get back to ambient conditions. So uh, this instrumentation will be in work for, uh, for a good part of the day. All right, well, Charlie, thank you for taking a couple minutes to walk us through the, the, what the rest of your day is going to look like, which is still busy, even though we've gotten through the fueling portion. Uh, now it's uh, the rest of it they have to, to get through. So thank you for taking a couple minutes to talk to us. No problem, my pleasure. <laughs> and that's Charlie Blackwell Thompson, uh, NASA test director uh, here in fire room number four in the uh, Launch Control Center. Uh, we are, uh, as she said, we're about uh, 18 minutes and 30 seconds away from coming out of this current one hour built in hold at the T minus three hour point in this tanking test countdown. Uh, as she said, no, no issues with the, uh, the ground umbilical carrier plate, uh, or known as the GUP, which uh, did leak on November 5th during the real launch attempt for discovery and uh, causes the scrub that day. No issues with that, and um, so far no uh, obvious signs of foam cracking or anything. Uh, other obvious issues have uh, cropped up during uh, this morning's tanking process. So. Um, Data continues to be gathered and uh, will the next 24 hours or more. And the uh, team will continue uh, here in the Launch Control Center and uh, also in Houston. We'll continue monitoring uh, the progress of today's test. And we'll uh, take a couple minute break and then come back with, um, with uh, sort of a recap and uh, where we are at this point, what, uh, what lies ahead for Discovery and uh, the space shuttle program coming up in the next uh, few weeks and months uh, towards, as we head towards Discovery's next launch opportunity. Joining us now um, to uh, end up our commentary is uh, the person we brought on to start our commentary, Mike Moses, He's the Space Shuttle Program Launch Integration Manager. Um, we've been hearing about it this morning, Mike, but uh, so far so good in the test uh, so, you know, results so far. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, the GUP didn't leak, which was uh, a good milestone. We've talked to the teams recording the data. Um, the temperature data looks like what they were expecting it to look like. Um, they're, uh, they couldn't even wait for the computers to do the processing. They're down by hand, typing things into Excel spreadsheets to try to look at temperature data and strain data, and that's all looking in family too. So they're they're pretty excited with all that. So yeah, it looks like we're getting good data. Like like anything with the hazardous operation, it's it's nice and boring today, which is a good thing. So everything's looking just the way it's supposed to. You engineers love data. Well, and speaking of which, you're going to continue to gather data for the next uh, day until the tank warms up to uh, ambient you know, air temperature. Yeah, one of the, one of the things they are going to do is let this run through all the way through drain and, and uh, recovery, which is uh, 
data we don't have, so that'd be good to see too. So, so this will put us um, at that point. What? Uh, how long do you expect the analysis to take? Basically, a rough time frame. Um, well, it's gonna t it's gonna stretch over a couple of weeks uh, in the short term. Um, we're going to kind of look for correlation to the model predictions to make sure everything looked linear with what the models were predicting. We kind of expect that uh, story to come in on Sunday. Um, and then uh, that would tell the team that from a configuration standpoint, we, we captured what we were looking for, and they can go ahead and deconfigure out at the launch pad and be ready for rollback. Um, but then the detailed analysis is going to take a couple of weeks as it feeds into all the rest of the testing. In fact, some of the data might not be analyzed for months uh, as it goes in and looks at the long-term model effects. But in terms of flight rationale data, uh, we're going to get to that right away, and we should start start looking at that as early as this weekend. And then the plan is, um, if everything goes well, is uh, no earlier than, I guess, Tuesday morning, early morning Tuesday, we'll be uh, taking Discovery off the launch pad and back to the vehicle assembly building. Yeah, that schedule's changing constantly because <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of work that has to be done, and, the, and then the work we do in the VB is moving around a little bit, so the, the ground processing teams are doing their usual amazing job. But uh, yeah, basically the rough plan is to deconfigure, break all the connections out of the pad, uh, roll back into the VAB, establish all the platforms and access in there, and then we have to build up some scaffolding. The uh, you know the, the main reason to go back is to get the X-rays on the back side of the tank, and and there is a platform that goes there, but it's about uh, oh maybe two feet wide and and uh, a very long drop all the way down to the deck of the MLP, and so we got to build some scaffolding and some uh, some personnel fall protection uh, in for that to get the teams up there to do the X-rays. It goes up about probably 25 feet off uh, off the deck of that platform they'll be they'll be getting access so over the Christmas time between Christmas and New Year's our uh, our NDE our non-destructive evaluation team will be busy shooting x-rays and then uh, and then we'll move into January time frame to look at what we need to do uh, any future work on the tank and that means potential modifications or anything else you might do in, in addition to obviously getting it ready to get back into a flight posture and then yeah correct uh, you know we got to take the instrumentation off shoot the x-rays and then if we're going to do a mod that's when we do it uh, and then respray the foam and close out the areas from where we had the instrumentation and then get back out to launch pad uh, not to put you on the spot and obviously the data is not even in even though people are looking at it in the basements right now um how confident are you that uh, is the shuttle program confident that, that this data and all the data you're doing and the, the modifications if you have to make any all that will be pulled together the uh, the, the, the work being done at Michoud to mock up uh, all that pulled together will get you to uh, back to a launch posture by you know February. Well, it's definitely get us back to a launch posture. All that's been coming along. It's just the timing of it, and then are we at a point where we're comfortable and we've had enough independent checks to make sure that we're we're not missing anything. So I really think we're going to get there. Um, February third's a, a challenge, but we'll we'll stay on it. It's a it's a target for the milestones right now, and we're not going to pick an official launch date until we have a much better. A much better look at what the data is really telling us. So. All right. Now we'll see that in the next few weeks, I guess, then. All right, yep. Mike Moses, thank Thanks. you for taking the time to and good luck with the rest of the uh, data gathering. No problem, Mark. Thanks. All right. We're going to um, uh, come up next. We're going to go to the Mission Control Center and uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston for an ISS update. It's going to be a busy day aboard the uh, orbiting laboratory where three new crew members will be arriving in a Russian Soyuz spacecraft this afternoon. And we'll join the Expedition 26 crew. And this is where we'll end our NASA TV coverage of the Space Shuttle Discovery's tanking test. We'll continue to provide updates online and uh, at, at any time, basically, at, at NASA main shuttle website, www.nasa.gov shuttle. So from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, this is NASA Public Affairs.